latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in Edinburgh. The A7 is partly blocked by an accident at the junction with Fernie Hill Road at Dander Hall, causing delays. In North Yorkshire, the A61 is closed each way off the A658 between Panel and Wheaton after an accident. On the M1 in West Yorkshire, there's a lane closed northbound. Someone's broken down between junctions 39 and 40 near Wakefield, causing delays. On the M57 on Merseyside, there's a lane closed northbound for emergency repairs at junction 1 for the M62, causing delays. Now, on the M27 in Hampshire, there's a lane closed eastbound. Someone's broken down at Junction 8, the Burzeldon and Hambleton. It's slow towards and past there. And there's widespread disruption to some train services in England this morning because of industrial action. With no service on some routes and reduced service on a number of other routes. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Are our relationships with foreign countries actually undermining free speech on a day-to-day basis in our universities? Well, it's very good to be with you. It's difficult to form a, a kind of clear conclusion because, as we know, universities are much, much more reliant on international fees than they used to be. We are seeing some sort of troubling developments, particularly at the level of admissions criteria. We're seeing quite stark and, frankly, scandalous disparities in the admissions criteria for domestic students as against foreign students in some universities. And so part of the problem is that the financial incentive structures um, are such that uh, universities risk becoming more and more dependent upon foreign regimes um, because they're simply bringing in an awful lot more money. Um, uh, James, fees... of course, this, this, uh, all of this discussion, we say countries, countries, countries. Uh, frankly, mainly, we're really looking at one country, aren't we? China. Well, China def- is certainly a, a, a focus. I mean, nearly one in three undergraduate students uh, from overseas at Russell Group universities are from, were from China in 2021. 60% of overseas postgraduates uh, come from China. Uh, we know from uh, the FBI and the Five Eyes security chiefs that um, China I- I is a, a master at intellectual property theft. Uh, and of course, there's a whole range of human rights issue concerns over Taiwan, Tibet, Uyghur Muslims, uh, lockdown tyranny. I mean, all of these are issues about which you know researchers and academics should be free to teach. Uh, and question and in universities where there is a heavily heavy commercial reliance uh, on regimes uh, like China, there are obvious uh, wow. disincentives to uh, uh, ensuring that academics and, and students are free to speak their mind on those issues. on Monday the 8th of April. This is Britain's News. I'm TV News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Good morning. Start of another week. So there's a manhunt underway. Police are looking for 25-year-old Habiba Masum after a woman was stabbed to death in front of her baby in Bradford. Rain is... Yes, we'll have all the latest updates as West Yorkshire Police ask people not to approach Habiba Masum and to report any sightings to them on 999. Rainer's tax turmoil questions continuing now about whether the deputy Labour leader paid the right amount of tax on the sale of a former council house in 2015. We're going to be debating it in the programme. And changing the guard, we're going to show you some lovely pictures this morning. France is going to become the first non-Commonwealth country to take part in the changing of the guard ceremony at Buckingham Palace this morning. Approved by the king himself, it will celebrate 120 years since the signing of the Entente Cordiale between Britain and France, translating into English as warm understanding. More details shortly. <laughs> Andrew Pierce, did you just blow your lips? I did. Well, hang on. What about what, Entente Cordiale? What are they doing about the migrants? Nothing. Uh, a bad day for Boeing. A, this is extraordinary footage. A Boeing 737 had to make an emergency landing after an engine cover fell off and struck a wing flap during takeoff on Sunday. What would you do if you're on the plane watching this unfold? Scream. Yeah.
And table manners as well this morning. Does it matter if you put your elbows on the table? I think it probably does. This is Generation Z, so that's under 27. They don't think it really matters if you lean on the table, use the knife and fork. But aren't most of them oh, on right. their phone anyway while yes, having their dinner? they are. In some houses, not in mine. Uh, let us know your thoughts this morning. We're not doing GB News anymore. Forget the email address. Wipe the house of your mind. It's gbnews.com forward slash your say. So it's a live comments board. We can see it live. Can. Be nice. And then you can also interact with each other as well. So get your laptops up, get your phones up. gbnews.com forward slash your say and be involved in the show this morning. First though, the very latest news with Sam Francis. Beth and Andrew, thank you very much and good morning from the newsroom just after 9.30. A recap of the headlines. Millions of senior citizens will feel the benefits of an 8.5% pension boost today worth up to £900 for those claiming the full amount. It means last year's rate of £10,600 will rise to £11,500. The Liberal Democrats say, though, more pensioners will now be dragged into paying income tax. But Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride told GB News this morning that the government is committed to supporting pensioners. We're committed, for example, to the triple lock, which, as you know, is putting up pensions year on year by the greater of 2.5% uh, or earnings or the level of inflation. And I think that's one of the proudest achievements, actually, of this Conservative government that has brought that in, because it's meant that since 2010, uh, pensioners are £1,000 a year better off than they would have been had their pensions just gone up by earnings alone. Labour says that it will digitise children's medical records if it wins the next election. It's hoped that modernising what's known as the Red Book would boost vaccination rates and improve access to health care. It would see parents receive automatic notifications for appointments and health information via the NHS app. A group of former diplomats say the Foreign Office should be replaced by a new department that they say is less rooted in Britain's colonial past. In a new report titled The World in 2040, the former officials say the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office is anchored in the past. And they also say the office's location in Westminster, next to St James's Park in London, is elitist and that it should be replaced by premises with fewer colonial era pictures on the wall. The report calls on Parliament to rebrand the department, creating what they've called a more open work working culture as part of its new forward looking mandate. Those are the latest headlines. More in the next half hour. Until then, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Good morning. Oh, it's always a bit of a rush on a Monday morning, isn't it? <laughs> we are ready, I promise you. Uh, right, welcome. Britain's newsroom, GB News, Andrew Pearce, Bev Turner. Uh, grim news, though. Police have named a suspect as the search continues for the man who stabbed a woman to death in broad daylight in Bradford City Centre as she was pushing, pushing a five-month-old five baby. That's chair. right. We're, we're looking at the suspect here. West Yorkshire police detectives are searching for 25-year-old Habiba Masoom. He's believed to have links to the Burnley and Chester areas. Well, joining us now from Bradford at the scene is our reporter Anna Riley. Anna, this is horrific. Uh, uh, in, in broad daylight, he stabbed her four times in the neck uh, and she, she, she died in hospital. Yes, a truly shocking case and something that the community here is still reeling from. As you say, that manhunt continues to find the 25-year-old suspect. Uh, the police have said that he was known to the 27-year-old victim, but it's not known what their relationship was. And as you said, yes, quite shocking, really. Broad daylight, 3.20 in the afternoon on Saturday, she was pushing her baby boy in a pram in this Westgate area of Bradford, close to the city centre, where she was stabbed multiple times. She was uh, rushed.
rushed to hospital, but tragically uh, she wasn't saved and she died. Now, this manhunt is continuing. Police are urging people uh, not to approach um, Habib Masoom, but they've said that any sighting should be reported to them on 999. Uh, the force has said that a knife was found at the scene, but it's still not clear uh, whether Mazoom is armed. As he said, he's from the Oldham area, but he's got links to Burnley and Chester. He's been spotted on CCTV uh, wearing a duffel coat of three colours, three large horizontal lines of grey, white and black, uh, light blue or grey tracksuit bottoms with a small black emblem on the left pocket and maroon trainers. In terms of his build, he's slim build and he's an Asian man. Pictures have been put out as well. You may be able to see those on screen as to what he looks like. Uh, now, Detective Chief Inspector Stacey Atkinson of West Yorkshire Police has said, we have, significant, we have had significant resources following up a number of lines of inquiry to locate Habiba Masoom, but at this time his whereabouts are unknown. A knife was recovered from the scene of the murder, but we cannot say if he's armed, and I would urge anyone who does see him not to approach him, but to call 999 immediately. She said as well, if anyone has any information about his movements or whereabouts since 3.20pm on Saturday, please contact the police as a matter of urgency. She also goes on to say that uh, police understand that the murder of a young woman in such shocking circumstances has caused considerable concern in the local community and that residents can expect to continue to see a significant police presence in Bradford as they make further inquiries and conduct reassurance patrols in the area. So that's the information that we know so far and as we have more updates we will be able to bring them. All right, that's Anna. Thank Riley. you, Anna. A shocking story. He apparently he was from Bangladesh. He came here to do a degree in marketing. <sighs> what a coward! It's awful, awful it's, story. It's just brutal and shocking in broad day in, in front of the five-month-old baby. Awful. Uh, well, there is we, there is a very clear picture of him and a clear description as well. If you're listening on the radio, try and find uh, we've seen an image here try yeah. try and get access to the phone if you're in that area particularly uh, in the Chester area or Bradford area if you see him call the police yeah. don't approach him absolutely uh, I'm watching your messages coming in live this morning on our new system here gbnews.com forward slash your say as opposed to emailing us and um, the GB News, your TV channel is fantastic, says David. Um, thank you very much. Um, and then Neil is, is looking forward, actually, to this changing of the guard, in, including uh, the French uh, cavalry. At Buckingham Palace. This morning. And Neil says, when our son was in the household cavalry, the regiment paraded along the Champs-Élysées on horseback in support of the Entente Cordiale. They were warmly welcomed by the French equivalents. It's really nice to see us reciprocate. We're going to be bringing you those pictures uh, this morning. I, I once that was at Buckingham Palace, I'd been to a press conference and I had to get out to, to get somewhere very uh, urgently. Change of the guard happened. I was trapped for 50 minutes. <laughs> you, 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 they, you, they won't let anybody Quite out. A good excuse, they, would not, they would not let the Prime Minister out if he or she was trying to get out. Change in the guard happens and it always happens at the same time and nothing is allowed to. And did you say, do you know who I am? I didn't. Uh, I had Paul... to do a radio interview, actually, on the concourse of Buckingham Palace, which is quite a good place to do it, actually. Very good. Well, Paul has got in touch and said, Angela Rayner's financial disclosures make for an interesting read. Well, let's yes. hope so. Well, we're going to be debating that because uh, she is in hot water. She is about paying the incorrect tax back in 2015. So does this bother you? She is strenuously denying these claims of whether she should have paid more capital gains tax on the council house that she bought and then sold, We're making about £50,000 increase on that. We're going to be discussing whether she should come clean on that. And does it really affect Sir Keir Starmer? And we just before, and, and on that, David Lammy, who will be foreign secretary in the Labour government, says... She's northern. Uh, yeah, what's that got to do with it? And you <laughs> don't judge us the way you judge if people are in government. Yes, we do. Does it mean we can't, do our, we can't do our maths if we're northern? Well, I'm of, offended, David. Yeah, yeah, so all northern voters, that's what David Lammy thinks. It's different if you're northern. She's a northern woman. Who'd have guessed it? Don't go anywhere. The Britain's Newsroom on GB News. This is GB News. Britain's News Channel. Offline and overlooked. That's what Age UK say millions of British pensioners are. Why? Because they cannot or won't access the internet. 
it's leading to digital exclusion. So the charities campaigning for public services like banks, utilities and even the NHS to maintain a more human approach. Everything's online. People assume you've got a smartphone with a, with a mobile number and uh, an email and without that you don't exist in this world anymore. We've got to try and get the government to see that it's so important to make people feel that they belong because there's a, there's a feeling that the older generation just feel that they're forgotten, they're in the way, and we already know that anyway, but it's just another reason for them to feel that they're not wanted. They'll just accept it, and they'll say, well, that's it, I can't do it anymore, and that's it, whereas other people would be really kicking and screaming. So we need to be the voice for older people. Despite digital technology playing an increasing role in our lives, around one in five over 65s in the UK don't use the internet. Thornycroft Centre in Pontefract, West Yorkshire, provides a space for this age group to socialise and get help to go online. I'm not right good with mobiles, so when you mention anything about online, I ain't a clue what you're talking about. The closure of thousands of banks is also detrimental to the older generation. A lot of our members what come, they tend to use cash. Um, they don't like to use bank cards. I think a lot of it's trust or the lack of knowledge. They don't understand how it works. I think they're very vulnerable as well with online. It's really important that they're aware how to use it and how to use it safely. So, in an online era, it's still crucial for many to have an offline option. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. We are proud to be GB News, the People's Channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. Right, get this, Labour leader, De Deputy Leader Angela Rayner is being smeared over her tax affairs, apparently because she's a northern woman. <laughs> well, that's according to her Labour colleague, David Lammy. He's in, he, what a foolish, stupid thing to say. <laughs> um, just to remind people about David Lammy, when he was on Celebrity Mastermind, he was asked which <laughs> monarch followed Henry VIII, and he said Henry VII. <laughs> Right. Maybe, maybe just Labour just aren't good at any kind of numbers <laughs> issue. She's under pressure over her tax affairs, and it's relating to the sale of her, of her, her, her home back in 2015, a former council house which she bought and derived by. Mm. She says uh, it was her principal residence. As opposed to her second home, which, which would have been applicable for council, uh, exactly. capital gains tax, wouldn't it? So is she says she's taken independent advice to say that she's in the clear. The pressure is publish it. Should she just come clean? What would she have to say to put your mind at rest at home? And actually, would it affect anything about who you're going to vote for? Well, joining us now is former UKIP leader Henry Bolton and former editor of Labourlist Peter Edwards. Peter, are we being a bit harsh, the mainstream press here? Most of the newspapers are going after Angela Rayner on this one. I have to say, I feel a little bit sorry for her. I think it's probably a little bit of an oversight or maybe she just slightly bent the rules. Uh, I, I would not say that she bent the rules, but I think it was the royal family that had that phrase about n never complain, never explain. So the, the media are always going to be tough on Labour in an election year, uh, and the party has to live with that. Where I perhaps challenge some parts of the media is it's inverting the principles of British justice. It's not that someone that's innocent and has to prove they're innocent. It's if a newspaper like the Mail on Sunday 
believes that Angela Rayner is guilty of wrongdoing, it has to prove that. And from what I've read so far, it's not been proven. So according to British justice, you don't have to prove yourself innocent. It's down to your well, accusers to come up with something. Well, Peter, you probably haven't read, read enough of the coverage then, because the, the Mayor of <laughs> Sunday has quoted extensively mm. neighbours of the house where she claimed to, she was living, and they said she did not live there. She moved out, she moved in with her husband, and the house was rented out to her brother. That's what the neighbours have said. Are the neighbours lying? Well, I've no idea, and Andrew. Well, how, much how can as you, you assume? To me, well, how can you assume then that, that Peter? You said the Mail on Sunday have produced no evidence. They produced a series of neighbours who said she's lying. I'm asking you: Are the neighbours lying? Andrew, first of all, the Mail on Sunday have produced allegations. They've not produced proof. Secondly, uh, the neighbours in Stockport or up the road, I've not met, so I'm not. I'm not going to trash them uh, when I've I've no idea who they are. But I'm sure, as a reasonable person, you accept the point. It's down to an accuser to prove wrongdoing rather than a politician to have to prove their innocence. Henry, does she have to prove her innocence now? Does she have to come out and show maybe the tax return from that year or uh, perhaps there was written correspondence from a tax advisor to say that she didn't have to pay capital gains? Indeed, I think that was... Oh, I, think, I think we've almost moved past that point now. Um, that's what she should have done at the beginning. Look, mm. this is a non-story, everybody. Here is the legal advice I've taken. This is my accountant's advice. I've complied with that fully. Uh, if there is a problem there, then uh, you know, let's get that out in the open and I will address it. That could have killed this dead, probably, but she didn't. She's kept this, uh, whatever advice she's had from whoever she's had it, she's kept that a secret. It's not out there in the public eye, and I appreciate there might be some public information, uh, some private information in there that she doesn't want to reveal. Well, that needs to be redacted. But the, fundamentally, what we've got here is a, a situation that she is creating or she is enabling, the Labour Party is enabling, and that is that to, to further the, the disappointment of the British people in terms of the transparency and the integrity of our politicians on all sides. So, you know, we're not talking about William Ragg at the moment, but there's the man on the Conservative side who should be out now without any hesitation. If he doesn't resign, he should be kicked out. I'm saying the same thing about Angela Rayner. She should publish whatever she, what her defence, if you like, or go. And that's not a matter. We've just heard that that's, you know, there are accusations. Yes, there are plenty of accusations out there that are unfounded. And many, many people in, in all sorts of walks of life have lost their jobs, had their lives dis destroyed because of accusations that have been unfounded. Well, you know, let's see that this is unfounded. If Angela Rayner has got the evidence that it's unfounded, why doesn't she clear it up? Mm. Peter, do you think that, ironically, this might play to the benefit of Labour? Because there are some people, I think, who would go, well, actually, if I had a second home or if... Uh, but the reason we're talking about a second home is because it was... She bought the council house, hadn't it? I think we have to be really clear about this. But then she'd moved in with her then-partner. Yeah, but she says she's... But she says her... She kept the council house... As the prime as a, residence. As her principal residence. As a principal residence. And I think there'll be people saying, well, £1,500 she should have paid. Maybe it doesn't really matter now. It was a few years ago. You know, stop giving her a hard time. It casts her a bit of a victim, and some people might vote for Labour because they feel a bit sorry for her. I wouldn't put it quite in those terms. So I think honesty and integrity are important all the time, even if we're talking about pounds. Although, obviously, viewers will remember that Nadim Zahawi, the former Tory chair, had a reported settlement of £5 million with HMRC, which led to his resignation. I think there's a broader point that certain parts of the public realise that Labour get a very tough time in election year. Um, you'll both remember that when Ed Miliband was leader, there was an allegation against him in several newspapers that ran and ran and ran over inheritance tax um, alleged avoidance. And that was also not proven. So it's, these things do come up in an election year. Secondly, I'd say Angela's published more information about her separation, her home and her children, all mm. quite intimate matters than many other politicians ever do. Henry, um, Peter mentioned Nadine Tahawi and the £5 million. It's not about the amount of money, in my view. It's about the principle. If tax was due, it should have been paid. And, if it's, and, and, and is she being honest about it? It doesn't matter if it's £500 or £5 million, in my view. I, I agree. It's about whether or not she's lying about it. If, if this was an innocent mistake, she should cough up to it and pay what's due. 
um, and, and show, provide some sort of evidence that she's not been lying with ill intent. Now, there's two other things about this. One is she's been asked about this many, many times. Um, she has denied it vociferously. And then the Mail on Sunday published evidence that she's lying. Um, and it's pretty damning evidence, I have to say. Um, mm. And it's certainly, I mean, I'm a former police officer. It would be the sort of evidence that absolutely I'd want to open an investigation about if it was a criminal matter. But there's the other thing that, that um, she has also, it's, it, there's a hypocrisy there. She has called upon various Conservatives to resign with immediate effect because they have demonstrated that they've lied or misled somebody or something, including Boris Johnson. Um, and now she's failing to meet the same standards that she was applying to them. And the third thing is that the other element that we, we've not mentioned in, the, in this particular discussion so far is that uh, is about where she registered for uh, 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 standing for in the general election. So um, she's there is this issue, and I don't know the the, the, the detail. I don't, well, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't like to judge it, but still there is an issue as to whether or not she lied about where she was living, whether it was the address that she registered mm. for the election. That needs to be investigated as well. This uh, is a whole series of things that are making her, and I think the Labour Party and all politicians, look extremely bad. It needs to be dealt with. It cannot go on. Mm. British public are losing credibility by the, uh, mm. in their politicians by the moment. Peter, and this is just making is, matters worse. Is, is David Lammy right that we're treating her differently because she's a woman and because she's northern? Because in my experience, northern women are pretty good at sticking up for ourselves. Well, 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 I've lived in West Yorkshire and in Carlisle, so it's it's a very uh, blunt environment which I enjoyed. I, I've not seen everything David Lammy said, but I think you both agree there is. Um, I think there's a bit of an undercurrent of sexism in British kind of um, political journalism, almost non-stop, um, and and it was very sad. But but that that's a separate point that everyone has to be honest about their tax affairs, with, with no mm. exception. OK. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Fascinating. Very much. Henry Bolton, Peter Edwards there. Um, lots of you getting in touch on here. And in fact, Onslow has just got in touch to say, Al Andrew has got his elbows on the table. But I'm not having me dinner. <laughs> I'm not having my lunch. This is because in just a moment we're going to be talking about whether you could, should put your elbows on the table. Is that acceptable anymore? Are manners relevant? I think so. They are. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News, the People's Channel. And uh, Marco has your weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. I'm afraid we hold on to unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead. All of us seeing further spells of rain at times, coupled with quite strong winds at times too. Back to the detail for today, and we've got some bright weather across the south and east of the UK during the morning, but notice showery bursts of rain out towards the west up across parts of northern England, and further showery bursts of rain will work their way up from the south into many parts of England and Wales as we go through the rest of the day. Some of those uh, outbreaks of rain turning quite heavy into the afternoon. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain later, where Scotland, seeing the best of the sunshine throughout the day, just a bit of patchy rain across the far south later on. Feeling pleasant enough in that sunshine in the north, up to 12 degrees, but the warmest temperatures generally down to the, towards the southeast, coupled with that uh, wind and rain, though. As for the evening and during the overnight period, we'll see some clearer spells developing across the southeast of the UK for a time, and some clear spells towards the far northwest. But on the whole, low pressure will be dominating the scene, giving a lot of wind and rain, particularly windy down towards the southwest. And wherever you are, with that wind and rain around, it will stay quite mild for the time of year. As for Tuesday, well, another very unsettled day on, on the cards across the UK. Low pressure sitting right across the UK, bringing spells of wind and rain. The wettest weather generally likely up towards the southern and eastern parts of Scotland, could see up to two inches of rain in places here. And the windiest weather generally out towards the west and across uh, some southern coasts of England, with gales in places here at times. Temperatures generally cooler than over the last few days, up to 12 or 13 Celsius at best. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Okay.
Um, now, so there's lots of messages coming in this new system, isn't there? Love this new system. I'm sorry, it looks terribly rude if I'm looking at the screen this morning. I'll, you could do a lot of talking, I'll just sit here and do a lot of reading. They're more interesting than you. Uh, you at home, honestly, you've been so brilliant. Denise said, love GB News. You two are my favourites. Thank you, Denise. That's nice. And Steve Rain is a backstreet £5 woman who for some reason is protected by Flip-Flop Starmer. I wonder how he feels about this, because he's not her biggest fan, is he? No, he doesn't like her at all. But, uh, but he's lumbered with her because she was elected to that post by Labour MPs, so she... he he can't move her. Would well, you think he'd quite like? Is, will, will Starmer be slightly enjoying this? A bit. Oh, but she's good scandal. for the brand because he, she, she's an authentic working class voice, isn't she? And Labour need to connect with that. Yeah. Constituency. Warren says she must resign. William Rag must resign. Oh, it's good. This I'm going to carry on reading. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In North Yorkshire, the A61 is closed each way off the A658 between Panel and Wheaton after an accident. On the M1 in West Yorkshire, there's a lane closed northbound where someone's broken down between junctions 39 and 40 near Wakefield. Trains in West Yorkshire have been stopped northbound from Huddersfield to Leeds because of an operational incident. On the M62 in Cheshire, there's a lane closed eastbound where someone's broken down between junctions 11 and 12 towards the M60 Eccles interchange causing delays. On the M27 in Hampshire, there's a lane closed eastbound where someone's broken down at junction 8. Burzeldon and Hamilton. It's slow towards and past there. Now, there's widespread disruption to some train services in England today because of industrial action, with no service on some routes and reduced service on a number of others. And all Skillonian ferry sailings between Penzance and the Isles of Scilly are cancelled at the moment because of high winds. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my God, argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Morning, it's 10 o'clock on Monday, the 8th of April. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with me, Bev Turner, and Andrew Pearce. Manhunt underway. Police looking for 25 year old Habir, Habir Masoom after a woman was stabbed to death in front of her little baby in Bradford. Yes, that manhunt does continue. Police are urging people not to approach Habib Mazoom, but report any sightings to 999. We'll have more on this story shortly. And new state pension rates for the tax year come into effect from today. It's a pay rise for some, but not good news for everyone. We'll explain why. And they're changing the guard, literally at Buckingham Palace. France is to become the first non-Commonwealth country to take part in the ceremony at Buckingham Palace this morning. Approved by the King himself, the ceremony will celebrate 120 years since the signing of the Entente Cordiale between Britain and France, translating into English as warm understanding. More details shortly. <laughs> 
and our table manners in perilous decline. Elbows on the table, talking with your mouth full. Apparently, Gen Z, that's under 26, 27s, they don't think that manners are relevant anymore at the table. What have we done? And it's a bad day for Boeing. If you're listening on, on the radio, a Boeing 737 had to make an emergency landing after an engine cover fell off and struck a wing flap during takeoff on Sunday. What would you do if you're on the plane watching this unfold? Every time I hear the changing guard at Buckingham Palace, I want to burst into song. That went well with Taylor Swift last week, though. Well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I won't do that. I still couldn't sing the Taylor Swift song, <laughs> like Sam Francis attempts to get me to sing it. Well, thank you, any of the words, any of us Who is she, anyway? Uh, we're going to be bringing those pictures of changing. I've got it's a beautiful day here down in London this morning. I hope it is where you are. Go on to our website this morning to talk to us, gbnews.com forward slash your say and we see the comments come at us live so far this morning you've been very kind and very nice don't last <laughs> first though also. here's your news with sam francis Bev and Andrew, thank you very much and good morning from the GB Newsroom. The headlines at 10 o'clock. Millions of senior citizens will feel the benefits of an 8.5% pension boost today, worth up to £900 for people claiming the full amount. It means last year's rate of £10,600 will rise to £11,500. However, the Liberal Democrats say the so-called stealth taxes will wipe out over three quarters of that increase as more pensioners are dragged into paying income tax. Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride told GB News the government is, though, committed to supporting pensioners. We're committed, for example, to the triple lock, which, as you know, is putting up pensions year on year by the greater of 2.5% uh, or earnings or the level of inflation. And I think that's one of the proudest achievements, actually, of this Conservative government that has brought that in, because it's meant that since 2010, uh, pensioners are £1,000 a year better off than they would have been had their pensions just gone up by earnings alone. Labour says that it will digitise children's medical records if it wins the next election. It's hoped that modernising what's known as the Red Book would boost vaccination rates and improve access to health care. Labour says it would see parents receive automatic notifications for appointments and health information via the NHS app. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer claims that his party would give power to the patient, giving more people control over their health care. Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting told GB News this morning that the plan will boost vaccination rates among children. We have a technological transformation fund in the NHS. Let's put it to good use to reduce our reliance on paper, to reduce our reliance on stamps and Royal Mail, and to provide people with a modern service in a way that they access pretty much every other major service in their life at the moment, whether that's online shopping and retail or, or anything else we do by apps. As we've been hearing, a manhunt is continuing after a woman was stabbed and killed in Bradford while she was pushing a baby in a pram. West Yorkshire police have re released these photos here, if you're watching on television, of a suspect wanted in connection with that attack, which happened in the city centre on Saturday afternoon. 25-year-old Habibu Masoom from the Oldham area is described as an Asian man of sw slim build, and he was pictured on CCTV wearing a coat with grey, white and black stripes. He's believed to have links with Burnley and Chester areas of the city. Police are warning people not to approach the suspect and they're asking anyone with information to contact 999. A group of former diplomats say the Foreign Office should be replaced by a new department that's less rooted in Britain's colonial past. In a new report titled The World in 2040, the former officials say the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office is anchored in the past. And they also say the office's location in Westminster, next to St James's Park, is elitist and that it should be replaced by premises with fewer colonial era pictures on the wall. The report calls on Parliament to rebrand the department, creating what they've called a more open working culture as part of its new forward looking mandate. Well, the start of the working week has been hit hard by severe travel disruption, with some trains not running across some of England's most busy rail routes due to ongoing strikes. 
Drivers with the ASLEF union have walked out in their long-running dispute over pay, with the South East and East Anglia the worst affected areas, including Southern, Greater Anglia and Thameslink. The dispute has been running now for two years, and travel correspondent for The Independent, Simon Calder, told us earlier that there's still no sign of a breakthrough. There will be hundreds of thousands of people who um, will be working from home today. Maybe it will kind of convince them that working from home is the way forward. But there is no suggestion that the dispute is anywhere near over. They haven't had any talks for a year. And finally, tens of millions of people will be looking to the skies later for what's set to be the most viewed total eclipse ever. While the weather might eclipse the excitement for some, it's a different story in Canada where the clear skies are set to bring near-perfect viewing conditions. Niagara Falls, though, has declared a state of emergency to manage those crowds, expected to be the biggest ever to flock to the popular waterfalls. And here in the UK, some parts of the country will have a small glimpse of a partial eclipse in the west and north, including Belfast, Glasgow and Liverpool, from just before 8 o'clock tonight. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan that code there on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com alerts. For now, though, it's back to Andrew and Beth. Ten oh seven. You with Britain's News and GP News with Andrew Pearce and Beth Turner. So, police have named a suspect as the search continues for the man who stabbed a woman to death in broad daylight in Bradford city centre. West Yorkshire police detectives are searching for 25-year-old Habiba Masoom, who's believed to have links to the Burnley and Chester area. Well, joining us now from Bradford at the scene is our reporter Anna Riley. Good morning, Anna. Uh, so the manhunt continues down there. Tell us a bit about the area where this happened. What's it like? Uh, yes, a truly shocking case. As you say, this, this manhunt continues. Uh, this is near the city centre. Um, we can actually see some uh, police community support officers uh, going past. Police have said that they are uh, upping their presence in this area. It's just outside of the city centre. It's an area called Westgate. Uh, close to where the incident happened um, is where I am now, near an international food store. It's quite near a, a busy road as well. Well, um, and it was uh, involving a 27-year-old mother. She was pushing her uh, baby in the pram while she was fatally stabbed to death. She was taken to hospital, but sadly uh, she could not be saved and she died. And that's why this uh, murder probe has now been launched. As you mentioned, police are on the hunt for 25-year-old Habia Masur. He's been pictured on CCTV. It, we may be able to have the picture to show you now, uh, wearing a duffel coat with three large horizontal lines of grey, white and black, that he was wearing a light blue or grey tracksuit bottoms with a small black emblem on the left pocket and maroon trainers. A witness also reported seeing him wearing a grey hoodie with the hood up after the incident that happened here on Westgate Junction with Druton Road, um, close to the city centre. It happened on Saturday afternoon afternoon at 3.20 and as you say a, a broad daylight attack several witnesses saw what had happened understandably shock throughout the community as to what has happened and then this this manhunt continues West Yorkshire police have put out a statement in which detective chief inspector Stacey Atkinson said we have had significant resources following up a number of lines of inquiry to locate Habiba Masoom but at this time his whereabouts are unknown a knife was recovered from the scene of the murder, but we cannot say if Habiba Mazum is armed, and I would urge anyone who does see him not to approach him, but to call 999 immediately. They go on to say if anyone has any information about his movements or whereabouts since 3.20 on Saturday to contact the police is a matter of urgency. And police also say they understand that the murder of a young woman in such shocking circumstances has caused considerable concern in the local community and that residents can expect to continue to see a significant police presence in Bradford as they make further inquiries and conduct reassurance patrols in the area. Area. I did just see some police um, community support officers, so that is ongoing. Um, we don't yet know the identification of the 27-year-old woman. 
all we know from police is that he that she was known uh, to Mazoom and that's all the information that's so far been released other than that her family have been informed of this tragic and horrific incident that happened in broad daylight that has shocked the community this manhunt ongoing police saying do not approach this man if you see him but report it instantly on 999 links here in Bradford but also links to Oldham Burnley and also links to Chester as well and as we have more on this case we will update you thank you Anna thank you very much somebody knows where he is yeah, I they would do. have thought they do um, and uh, interesting uh, a shopkeeper rushed out to try and help yeah. her and a doctor was driving past in his car stopped to help as well and, and gave her found a pulse and they gave her um, emergency resuscitation but and where's the baby who's got the baby hopefully there's a grandma hopefully or a family somebody. member um, a terrible business um, right a boost for OAPs or we're kicking the teeth they're set to see pensions increase by eight and a half percent but almost two million pensioners will be forced to pay income tax in the next four years because of the government's stealth tax freeze that's right. So joining us now is the Chief Economic Advisor for Centre for Economic and Business Research, Vicky Price. Good morning, Vicky. Great to see you. So just explain to us why this might be beneficial to some pensioners, but not to others. Oh, that's really interesting because, of course, we're talking about um, pensioners who started um, drawing their pension or retired after 2016, the summer of 2016, who get this full uh, rate state pension at present, which has gone up by eight and a half percent, which is good news. But there are loads more who, of course, retired a little bit earlier, uh, who don't get anything like that. Um, they are getting one part of it, if you like, which is a smaller bit, uh, increasing at uh, at this rate. But uh, the additional pension that perhaps they're getting or had been contracted out to be getting, uh, in addition to the uh, basic pension, the basic state pension that we're receiving at the time only goes up by 6.7%. So you have already a division between the sort of the older generation, which gets less, and the younger generation of retirees, which gets a little bit more. So there's confusion there already. And then there are some who, as you rightly say, are now being pushed into paying tax for the first time, and others were not. Mm. So there is a big, big discrepancy across. And to just summarise it by saying, you know, pensioners are doing so well because they get this 8.5% following about 10% a year before, um, is, I think, over-egging the pudding, if you like. And, and the, 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 the freezing of the uh, um, uh, personal allowances, Vicky, that's happening mm. over a four-year period. That's taking not just some pensioners into tax for the first time or even higher taxes. It's going to affect a lot of other people too. Um, people, nurses, teachers, doctors, all sorts of people are going to suddenly find they're either in the 40p tax rate or even worse, the 45p tax rate. Absolutely. So we've already had you know, quite a lot of pensioners saying that they are suddenly starting to pay tax. I think the calculation is about two million uh, of uh, uh, pensioners now over the last couple of years have now come into paying tax, which they weren't doing before. And then, of course, you know, there is the issue of those at the higher tax rate. But uh, you assume that the average pensioner, if they're getting an occupational pension in addition to their normal state pension, you know, are still probably not going to be at the 40 percent tax bracket. So, um, so that, that, I think, at least is the case for, for the majority. But yes, you're absolutely right. We've also seen uh, millions moving into the higher tax bracket as well, normally, uh, simply because of this tax freeze, the personal um, uh, allowance tax freeze, which has taken place. You know, it's been with us now for a number of years, and it's likely to continue unless, of course, the new government changes it. Vicky, you clearly, we realise you're not a financial advisor or necessarily a tax expert, but I imagine you'll have an opinion on this. How easy would it be for Angela Rayner to clear up whether she did not pay enough capital gains tax in 2015? What people are saying is perhaps she should publish the, the, the advice that she got and maybe that will sort things out. But I Could think that, just... that's where... The... Could it, could it have just been a phone call, though? If you speak to your accountant or a financial advisor, maybe it was just a phone call and they said, yeah, you can put this through. She wouldn't necessarily have a paper trail, would she? I have no idea, but she seems to suggest that she got advice and she doesn't want to publish it. Whatever that means, we suggest perhaps there is a paper trail. Hmm. Oh. Well, that's interesting, Vicky. <laughs> um, thank you for that. As ever. Thanks, so, Vicky Price. Yeah, Vicky Price. She's um, a great, great authority on the... Um, 
She's, uh, she's probably right. Maybe there is a paper trail. She doesn't want to publish it. But, but this pension business, you know, the, the, the Tories, Mel Strides, work in pension, he's wheeled out saying it's great news. It is great news if you get your eight and a half. If, but if you're not dragged into tax, and they've got to be honest about it. Well, look... That's what's so irritating. Well, Frederick, who's got in touch with our new system, dbnews.com forward slash your say, has said, I will pay more tax from today. Yeah. As my service pension will also go up the yeah. same amount. I used to pay £70 a month, but I will now pay £90 a month. Yeah. This is the issue, isn't it? And then Jacqueline has said, please remember that even those on full new state pension will receive a maximum of £900. Yeah. Those on the old state pension may get less, but they're able to top up by claiming pension credit, whereas those on NSP cannot. Pension credit opens doors to other monetary amounts which NSP claimants don't get. It's quite complicated, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But, but it's never quite as it appears to be on the tin with these politicians. Absolutely. Um, right, keep your, keep your messages coming. Sue, I love this channel. It's so refreshing. I wish the politicians from the two main parties would stop the political ping-pong. Rayner is guilty of throwing mud at the, at the Tories and now she's getting some of that back. Uh, and I saw him, somebody saying a message here, actually. Geoffrey, who is it? No, Warren says... Um, no, uh, somebody's p pointing out that she asked Bo Boris Johnson had to resign over a piece of cake. That was Angela Rayner's view. <laughs> right. This happened moments after takeoff in Colorado. And we're asking if you were on that plane, filming out of the window like you do, and you saw the engine flying off, what would you do? What would you do? Uh, hopefully not scream. Oh, I'd definitely scream. I'd be letting somebody know there might be a problem here. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. <laughs> Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Are our relationships with foreign countries actually undermining free speech on a day to day basis in our universities? Well, it's very good to be with you. It's difficult to form a, a kind of clear conclusion because, as we know, universities are much, much more reliant on international fees than they used to be. We are seeing some sort of troubling developments, particularly at the level of admissions criteria. We're seeing quite stark and, frankly, scandalous disparities in the admissions criteria for domestic students as against foreign students in some universities. And so part of the problem is that the financial incentive structures um, are such that uh, universities risk becoming more and more dependent upon foreign regimes um, because they're simply bringing in an awful lot more money. Um, and James, fees... of course, this, this, uh, all of this discussion, we say countries, countries, countries. Uh, frankly, mainly, we're really looking at one country, aren't we? China. Well, China is certainly a, a, a focus. I mean, nearly one in three undergraduate students uh, from overseas at Russell Group universities are from, were from China in 2021. 60% of overseas postgraduates uh, come from China. Uh, we know from uh, the FBI and the Five Eyes security chiefs that um, China is a, a master at intellectual property theft. Uh, and of course, there's a whole range of human rights issue concerns over Taiwan, Tibet, Uyghur Muslims, uh, lockdown tyranny. I mean, all of these are issues about which you know researchers and academics should be free to teach. Uh, and question and in universities where there is a heavily heavy commercial reliance uh, on regimes uh, like China, there are obvious uh, wow. disincentives to uh, uh, ensuring that academics and, and students are free to speak their mind on those issues. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Ten twenty with the Britain's newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner.
Former Labour advisor Matthew Lars is here and the broadcaster and author Emma Wolf in the studio for their weekly ding dong. Good morning. Good morning to you. <laughs> um, right, Boeing. We've yeah. been watching this yeah, footage amazing. this morning. They're having a bad year, Boeing. They've had, that, was, that was also one of their planes where the window flew out, wasn't it? We've all been there. When the, the plane is taking off and you're looking out of the window and you're excited, you've got your phone and then the worst thing happens. You start to see the engine falling apart. Matthew, what would you do? Would well, you scream? I think you, it? I think you scream, but you 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 then just I think you close your eyes, wouldn't you? Um, would you? Uh, I'm not sure. No, actually. But obviously, what everybody does now is get their phone out. But wouldn't you shout to the steward or to yeah. the, uh, yeah, the flight attendant just well, in case somebody? My, one of my very best friends. That's what I think fact, I would do. An ex of mine uh, who lives in America is a um, is an air steward on Southwest Airlines. Right. Well, that, so wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be your first job? But you just shout, stop! Yeah. Just yeah. stop! Wouldn't yeah. you? But what's that? interesting is I... he works with his mum, who's also a steward. So like you'd be. Able to say, if you thought you were actually going to crash, you'd say goodbye to your mum on the same flight because they sometimes do the same flights together. That's so dark. <laughs> Go on, Emma. Well, no, I just... Something about flying that is absolutely terrifying. It's sort of 99% of the time it doesn't go wrong. It's a bit mm. like driving. You sort of have to, like, yeah. not think too much about what's going on inside these engines, what is going on inside these... these um, yeah, no, th don't the, think the, about the it. The wing and all of this yeah. stuff. You don't think about it. Most of the time it's OK, and then it starts to fall if apart. If you start to think about flying logically, how does this great... Uh, how is it staying up? In the, air in the, first the pilot's place probably asleep up. in the cabin, yeah. having a snooze. You're yeah. in, on air, yeah. in the air for I 10 know. hours. What if he's been drinking? Or Absolutely she's been drinking? terrifying. I mean, no, you just have to get, get into a good book or go to sleep. Yes. Not but we're so yeah. polite, aren't we? The, we the, the Brits. The Brits are so polite. I think we would just sort of go... Just sort of nudge the person next to you and say, do you think that's quite right? I think we should say something. I know, I know. Um, but of course there's a serious issue here for Boeing which has had a terrible year yes. and they've just, um, the chief executive has just been uh, uh, elbowed out and there's big call for the next chief executive to have an engineering background rather than being an accountant. Yeah, and actually some of the right. big investors are keen that there is a, a worker on the board, a union person on the board, because they want somebody who actually knows what's going on on the shop and, floor on the board. So that's a big business story at the moment. Get to, there was a whistleblower yes. who exposed quite a lot of mm. yeah. malfeasance at that company who mysteriously died. Yeah, yeah, John Barnett was his name, and he was due to give evidence, wasn't he, on a yeah. Boeing situation. And then, and then he died on uh, 62 years old. Apparently, it was a self-inflicted wound. Mm. Nothing to see there. Very mysterious. Very um, mysterious. Right, let's talk about uh, A&E, shall we, Matthew? Absolutely. In a critical condition, how can this story be any different to what we've seen a million times well, before? Well, sadly, it seems they're getting even worse, that a bad situation is getting even worse. So there's more than 150,000 patients uh, waited for over 24 hours in A&E before getting hospital beds. So this is basically people on trolleys. This is the old, you know, we used to remember this in the bad old days, the NHS, the, the, tro the trolley crisis, and it's very much back with us. Um, that's 40,000 patients a month now wait, 12 hours in A&E, 50-fold increase so on numbers before the pandemic. What do you think your mates in the British Medical Association, the militant trade union, think about that? Well, the, what's their response? They're not my mates, because remember, they're not a Labour-affiliated union and yeah. the BMA stopped... Well, most, most of these trade unions are on strike, are your mates? No, uh, uh, only the train drivers. Um, and I hope they settle soon if the government spoke to them. Um, well, I mean, uh, I mean, I think we need a really, we need real reform in the NHS. And actually, West Street and Labour's health spokesperson has been talking this morning about a very simple thing, which is, I mean, you know, Bev uh, uh, and, and Emma will know the red book for every kid has oh, the yeah. details yeah. of their vaccinations, etc. To actually take that into the 21st century also, and put it online. How utterly hideous! Yeah. How utterly hideous! Are you against it? I thought you might. Of course, I'm against it. What's that got to do with it? Oh, sorry. Because it's much more efficient. This, no. Oh, it's not. I turn up half the time with my toddler. I don't know where the red book is. This A and E crisis is very simple. It's about the failure of social care in this country. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of patients who are waiting. <coughs> and Matthew, you refer to the trolley crisis. Actually, most of the time they're sitting on uncomfortable plastic yeah, chairs, no, waiting to be seen. They're not even on a. <coughs> they haven't even got into the corridors of the hospital. This is a failure of social care. Yeah, and I it's agree. A failure of primary care. If you can't get a GP appointment and you can't and you can't, you end up going to A&E if you're worried. Two-thirds of people are over 65. This is elderly people, often with mental health problems. Often they need something simple. Mm. They end up in A&E. They end totally. up blocking up the whole system. Mm. It's mm. not, you know, uh, flashing lights arriving in the ambulance. It's people that need care that could be dealt yeah. with yeah. further back yeah. down. Yeah. Absolutely. I quite agree. If people over 75 uh, spend more than 12 hours uh, in the emergency department, there's a 5% yeah. chance they're yeah. going to die. Elderly and, and that's a study from France. 
failing them. And, 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 we, and how often can you see a GP at the weekend? Uh, and, 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 impossible. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, we need... Um, these contracts have to be changed. Yes, we, these contracts need to be changed. And I think the GPs are um, in danger with the um, strike that they are threatening now. It looks like everybody else has settled apart from the junior doctors. Yes. Lots of pressure on those. But now the GPs are threatening. Now, one of the big mistakes the Labour government made, do you remember when John Reid, who's yeah. normally a hero, he stuffed the GPs' mouths with gold, as he said it, and that's when they stopped doing weekends and evenings. They you remember did. it was all went into centralised. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, I think the GPs may have a, a, a rude awakening when the contract negotiation well, comes, because they need, we it, need better service. But that was back in 2006, Matthew. Yes, it was. Why does it take... What, we've had a Tory government... Absolutely. Yes, yeah. So I'm admitting the Labour mistakes, but the Tories have done nothing about it either. Matthew I agree. Laza, you are a very, very intelligent man, but that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard you say, that it's about the Red Book. No, no, I don't think it's all about the Red Book. I'm saying what we need is change in the NHS, and it's just that Wes is talking about the Red Book this morning. I'm not saying that the A&E crisis is... But the, the idea that the, the Red &E digitising my child's vaccinations is going to be a vote winner, they have completely misread the room. Emma, am I right about that? Of course you are. So, because absolutely. what does that do, Matthew? What does that do? That means that when you go in next time, they can just sit there and go, oh, well, they haven't had this, and they haven't had this, and you're going to have it. No, you can't go to school until you've had it. Like, suddenly, it, it becomes on, transactional, well, it becomes conditional, it becomes bullying, and it becomes pressure on people. Well, I mean, we have seen, of course, the, uh, with, with the measles outbreak, we've seen the huge rush we've seen, uh, uh, with large numbers last week. It was announced that lots of people have been doing catch-up uh, on them. I mean, I think for the basic vaccination, I think that people, that the kids uh, should have them. But what I meant was... Yes, I wasn't but saying that's, very, that's different. Crisis. That's your opinion. Yeah. That's your opinion. But once you start mandating it with the states... That's what I'm terrifying saying is we need change territory. in the NHS and digitisation and efficiency. Uh, and this is just one small announcement that was made today. So I'm not saying it's responsible for the A&E crisis. He, it's he's, he's, not. he's also written an article in The Sun of all places he saying has. that the NHS in its current where it's operating is not fit for purpose. So what's he going to do about it? Well, I think is we he need to bring hear... in more private delivery. Yeah, he said that. He said that he's happy. Is the he's... Labour Party happy with that? Uh, well, he's been absolutely clear on it. And I've seen Wes um, with Labour audiences, and when he makes the case, um, uh, he can he can really push it. Because remember the GPs that we're talking about. Everybody forgets every GP is a small. I mean, ninety nine point five percent of them business. are small businesses. Yeah, yeah. Um, profit making small businesses, and they sometimes conveniently forget that when they're, when they're discussing. I mean, well, he's got this great phrase, Wes. He says the NHS needs to be a service. Not not a shrine. Well, I make this prediction. Sure, Wes Streeton yeah. will become the most unpopular Labour cabinet minister very quickly because they've raised, they'll raise expectations so high, Emma, but they'll do very little to reform the NHS. And what they're proposing is extra money is about two days extra care. Of course it is. <laughs> they haven't funded the, um, all these pledges. But I do think Wes Streeting is one of the most intelligent yeah, Labour... very effective. Labour, yeah, front benchers and cabinet min oh, shadow ministers. He'd have preferred to have been not in that job, in my view, well, because uh, he knows it's going to be impossible to deliver. I mean, it, it will be... Well, you say it's impossible to deliver, but we did make a difference last time uh, we were in government. And remember, these waiting lists, uh, that we didn't have a trolley crisis in, uh, 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 from basically most of the Labour the government. It wasn't £2 trillion in debt. No, absolutely, which is why Wes is clear that it's not uh, just about money. We didn't money. have a, such a it's big not, population no, as well. it's not just about money. an ageing um, population. Can yeah. we... Let's just talk about table manners. We've been discussing oh. it all morning. Emma, is it relevant? <laughs> Look at him with his arm on the table. 60%... Are you going to slap me breakfast, Andrew? 60% of 12 to... 60% of 12 to 27-year-olds generations that believe that table manners are no longer relevant and more than a third have admitted to using their phones at the table. Absolutely. Well, I would predict that most of those people are not even sitting at a table to eat. Yeah. I would predict they're either staring at their screens or they're lounging on a sofa, lying across yeah. their bed. I don't think that young people these well, days... Well, eating their dinner at the, on uh, their bed? Probably. Andrew, when my I children don't... make their meals at separate times, now they're teenagers, they pick up their plate and they expect to go to their room. And every time I say, don't you dare, sit down at the table, I don't care if you're eating on your own, I will sit with you and have a cup of coffee. The refrain... Because that is what they see. The refrain of my childhood was, elbows off the table, elbows off the table. Yeah, yeah. Talk your mouth full, Don't elbows off the mouthful, table. Yeah. I sit down with my three-year-old. I sit down. Even if I'm just having a cup of coffee and he's having his yeah. ridiculously early dinner at five o'clock, yeah. sit down and talk and even open a book, but no so, phones, no screens. You're together at the table, you're sharing food, so you're breaking bread. They I don't eat. think these youngsters are actually so, sitting at a table. No, so if they go into the bedroom, they're eating their food and then they're on their device. They want to take their, 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 their bowl of pasta upstairs and sit watching their laptop and that's why like they're this while they're as well, sat on the bed. Because they're just shoveling it in without even registering what they're eating. And it's absolutely vital because obviously all the studies show, I mean, there's a very serious side to this, that especially with early years, yeah. the more interaction you have, the more interested you get in the world, even if that's what you did today, you know, that has a huge impact on your learning Does. when you get into education. So. And you go the more serious point as well, Matthew, on that, is that if, you are if you're registering what you're eating, 
you're more likely to say, OK, I've had my I'm meal, full. I'm full. Whereas when you're staring oh. at a screen, you're not even thinking about it. Yeah. You're just going, you know, right. hand to mouth, hand to mouth. Yeah, it's awful. And there'll be, you'll, you'll see it when you go to hotels, there'll be people who've been away this week, Easter weekend, and been away with the kids. And you go around hotels, Andrew, you would die. I would love to take yeah, you. Yeah, it's a Because you walk cause... around and all the kids are sat Glued the device. with and, a device uh, on the yeah. table it, in a restaurant. And a couples it was staring at It was tradition in the, at home when we were kids. We all had our dinner yeah. together. Yeah, sit down and we talk. Had our tea. I mean, in the old days, when everyone in restaurants used to give you colouring books, you know, as was the, was the most, but at least you were sort of colouring and talking. At the you were going... Yeah, Play-Doh was mine when my kids were little. Yeah, it's sit still there. a family oh, meal, isn't it? It's still, you're engaging. Yeah. You're doing yeah. something. You're talking about the food. You're talking yeah. about flavours yeah. and colours. And Absolutely. Yeah. And that. open to the world. And you yeah. watch TV together, too, at the weekend. Yeah, we never had television. Game. I don't know Generation about that. Generation but... game. Uh, but there'll be people watching the under-27s who go, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it really matters. But we need to work out why it matters, because I don't think we have the language really so to I think explain elbows exactly. are the least of the problems. Yeah. Right, up next, why is the changing of the guard so special? It's a beautiful day here down in London. Look at this. They're changing guards at Buckingham Palace. I wish you would say. <laughs> Christopher Robin you, went did, down with Alice. Did you study music at school? No, you can tell, Clearly. can't you? Um, but we're seeing live. You know that. You all know that. Too. Too. Can we all, I think we're all going to have to sing it in the next section. Anyway, these are the live pictures outside Buckingham Palace as the excitement is building there. First, though, your morning's news with Sam Francis. Good morning from the GB Newsroom 1031 and leading the news this morning, millions of senior citizens will feel the benefit of an 8.5% pension boost from today, worth up to £900 for those that are claiming the full amount. It means last year's rate of £10,600 will rise to £11,500. The Liberal Democrats say more pensioners, though, are now being dragged into paying income tax. But the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, told GB News this morning that the government is committed to supporting pensioners. We're committed, for example, to the triple lock, which, as you know, is putting up pensions year on year by the greater of 2.5% uh, or earnings or the level of inflation. And I think that's one of the proudest achievements, actually, of this Conservative government that has brought that in, because it's meant that since 2010, uh, pensioners are £1,000 a year better off than they would have been had their pensions just gone up by earnings alone. Labour says it will digitise children's medical records if it wins the next election. It's hoped that modernising what's known as the Red Book would boost vaccination rates and improve access to health care. It would also see parents receive automatic reminders for appointments and health information via the NHS app. A group of former diplomats says the Foreign Office should be replaced by a new department that's less rooted in Britain's colonial past. In a new report titled The World in 2040, the former officials say that the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office is anchored in the past. They also say the office's location in Westminster next to St James's Park is elitist and should be replaced by premises with fewer colonial-era pictures on the wall. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan that code there on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And let's take a look at the markets this morning. The pound will buy you $1.2619 and €1.1661. The price of gold is currently £1,851.31 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,907 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Still to come. Shall I sing it again? No. Oh, the changing guard. The changing guard at Buckingham Palace. Christopher Robin went down with us. You can't say that without saying that. Uh, we are going to be bringing you uh, the pictures from their lovely day down here in London. A little bit of pageantry. It's what we need, isn't it? Britain's newsroom on GB News. <laughs> Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. Danny, there's an irony here, isn't there? And that is this. Um, on the one hand, the BBC expects older viewers to cough up more, and yes, every opinion poll of the land shows us, Danny, that older people are the least satisfied with the service they get. Well, the BBC don't give a damn about older people because 
as I discovered when I was binned for being 50 and white from the BBC in the Midlands to diversify the lineup, they're after a younger audience because the longevity of the institution, that's the BBC, Martin, relies on the next generation of licence fee payers. And this is quite important, and it's a great point that you've raised. Anybody who's over the age of 50, certainly 60, the BBC just doesn't care about you because they're interested in, in attracting the next generation of licence fee payers. And when those 25-year-olds that they're after at the moment become 40 and 45, they'll stop caring about them too. Otherwise, the BBC just won't exist. It relies on new uh, new blood, if you like, when it comes to the licence fee. So that's a great point. They just don't care about middle-aged people. And yet, they're, they're now floating the idea of older people paying more. How would that work? Would it be means-tested? I know. If ever, you, if ever you wanted to satisfy your curiosity that the BBC had a socialist agenda, it's the fact that they, they, they want the proletariat to pay more, sorry, to, to not pay, and the bourgeoisie to pick up the bill. This is classic Marxism for you. I know we're, we're, we're treating this lightly, Martin, but how would they means test you? Are you going to have to provide evidence of your bank account? And of course, people's financial situation, they change. You know, people's finances are fluid. So one year you may be what they class as, as wealthy, and then the next year you're not. So it's, mm. it's, a, it's a situation that I find just impossible. How it's going to work, I, I just don't know. It's something that I just don't feel happy about. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. Now, there's widespread disruption to some train services in England this morning because of industrial action, with no service on some routes and a reduced service on some others. In North Yorkshire, the A61 is closed in both directions off the A658 between Panel and Wheaton after an accident. The A1 in Lincolnshire is partly blocked northbound by an accident between Long Bennington and the Claypole turnoff, causing delays. In Cambridgeshire, the A14 is partly blocked east eastbound by an accident between junctions 36 and 37 near Newmarket with queues towards and past there and Skillonian ferry sailings between Penzance and the Isles of Scilly being cancelled at the moment because of high winds and that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Uh, we love hearing what you think at home sometimes. It's a bit high risk, though, isn't no, it? No, we don't mind. Uh, send your views and post your comments. Visit gbnews.com. Particularly, particularly when you're disagreeing with Bev. <laughs> forward slash your say. Here are the details of how to do just that. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. Oh, hello. <laughs> right, <laughs> we're having a chat. That finished quite quickly. Right, let's have a look at what you've been uh, saying at home. Um, here we go. Let me find them. They're coming through thick and fast. Right, Jeffrey has said that aircraft malfunction is not the fault of Boeing, but very likely caused by the engineer not, secu not securing the cowling clips correctly. But is it a Boeing engineer? In which case, it would be their fault. Probably. But who knew, honestly, the wealth of knowledge out there. Yeah. What's a cowling clip? Don't know. Do you know what a cowling clip no. is? Uh, Caroline has said, Sheffield's health service is great. This is about the NHS and how many people waiting in A&E. She said, I turned up for an X-ray on Saturday morning, was told the walk-in service only applied Monday to Friday, but was asked to wait a few minutes and was X-rayed within 30 minutes. Great service. And Steve has said, the NHS is probably the best funded service in the UK, if not the world. It doesn't need more money. It needs less paper pushing managers and yep. diversity staff that's absolutely right and this point steve bring back ward matrons give them a budget for each ward and unit oh those were the days do you know i can remember when Anne widdicombe was the shadow held secretary <laughs> back when william Hague was leader they were going to the tories were going to bring back matron she's make a great matron she'd be a very good matron there's a that sort voice, of but they never did it's a and sort it would have been so sensible large large busted woman of a certain age with a clipboard who can just and a pot of tea could just solve everything and in the also world, in my with opinion. a voice that would cut through a, 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 a yeah. brick wall <laughs>
<laughs> she'd, been, she'd have been a very good speaker of the house. But on, on talking to politicians, um, Sean says, middle class metropolitans seem obsessed with Rayner being northern and working class. I live in her borough. Us working class northerners have a different view of Rayner and our MPs and council. What do you think about it then, Sean? Tell us what you Send think. Send another message. Right, uh, for and the first time system. ever, Buckingham Palace this morning is going to be guarded by French troops to mark 120 years of friendly relations. In about half an hour, members of the Gendarmerie's Guard Republican. How was that? Very good French accent. <laughs> well, it's going to join better than my singing. Is that a French accent or was it German? <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> Camera <laughs> Walker is there. We'll, we'll go to Camera <laughs> Walker. <laughs> we will hopefully be talking English in yeah. an English accent. Camera, please don't mimic Beverly Turner's <laughs> French accent because um, it, it, it sounded like <laughs> out of Mongolia. Bonjour, Cameroon. Ça va? <laughs> So va bien, merci. <laughs> Thank you, Bev. I mean, your accent was great, not, not going to lie. Uh, it is the 120 years uh, since the Entente Cordiale was uh, signed between Britain and France, translated into English for Andrew's benefit, uh, warm understanding. And it, it stopped the disagreements between France and Britain, those historic disagreements, and laid the foundations for them working together between, uh, for World War I and World War II and that friendship ever since. It's not a military alliance, however. It was very much foreign diplomacy uh, and foreign, foreign policy. And the monarchy is the power of soft diplomacy personified. And British and French officials here today will be hoping that it's going to show the strength of the friendship between Britain and indeed France. So, approved by His Majesty the King for the first time today, French soldiers will be in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace taking part in the changing of the guard ceremony. 32 soldiers of the Gendarmerie Garde Republicaine, I'm not going to attempt the accent, uh, will be marching alongside 40 guardsmen from the F Company Scots Guards. They'll be parading together inside the forecourt of Buckingham Palace at 11 o'clock, so not long to go now. The Duke of Kent is the Scots Guards Royal Colonel. Uh, we don't expect him to be here today. Who we do expect is the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh. We saw them arrive around 20 minutes ago into Buckingham Palace, so that's Prince Edward and Sophie. They will be inspecting the troops on behalf of His Majesty the King. He is not in London. The Royal Standard is not flying above. Above, the, uh, above Buckingham Palace. He is still undergoing uh, cancer treatment at the moment and is not carrying, carrying out many public engagements. There's also 40 VIPs in attendance here today, including the UK Chief of Defence Staff, Sir Patrick Sanders, the French Chief of the Army, um, General Pierre Schill, and the French Ambassador to the United Kingdom, Hélène Duchesne. Uh, and although, of course, French soldiers are taking part in this ceremony, they will not, I'm assured, be guarding the King. That responsibility remains remains very much with British troops. Elsewhere, in Paris, across the English Channel today, a very similar guard change ceremony will be happening for the first time at the Elysee Palace in Paris. That's the French presidential palace. Um, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, will be in attendance there, where 16 soldiers of Number 7 Company Coldstream Guards will be taking part in that historic ceremony for the first time. So 11 o'clock here at Buckingham Palace, that changing of the guard ceremony will be taking place for the first time with both British and French troops. Um, Queen Victoria's son, Edward VII, was king when um, the Entente Cordiale was signed, and um, uh, to great fanfare. Do you know that off the top of your head? Well, it was 1904, so I know he was the king in 1904. Do you? Yeah, he, how, he... Many, how many can you... How many, like, how well do you know... I know you worked right, so the Royal Beat for a long time. Queen but... Victoria, yeah. followed by Edward VII. Yep. Followed by his father, George V. Uh-huh. Followed by Edward VIII, who abdicated. Followed yes. by George VI. Followed by Her Majesty the Queen. Followed by... Charles III. Oh, very good, Andrew Pearce. You're the person you want on a pub quiz, don't you, about royal affairs? The six wives of Henry VIII, you must know them. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, Divorced beheaded, beheaded survived. survived. So it was Catherine of Aragon, yeah. Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Kath uh, Anne of Cleves, who was the really ugly one, <laughs> uh, uh, who he'd only <laughs> seen in a, in a portrait. Yeah, she, and, uh, and then it was Catherine Howard who was, who was beheaded, and mm. then Catherine Parr survived him. Cameron, do you feel educated this morning? You didn't leave school that long ago. Was it a bit more interesting <laughs> at school than I do? <laughs> you don't do rote learning anymore. <laughs> We certainly did the Tudors. I don't think we did uh, those those early uh, uh, monarchs as well. But yes, uh, Andrew, very, very good. Uh, the 1904 Edward VII. 
is very impressive, wasn't it? Um, can I just ask you another question, Cameron, while you're here? We know that Prince Harry's going to be uh, coming uh, to, to the UK, isn't he? May time for the Invictus Games. Um, do we know anything else about that visit? What's he going to be doing? Who's he going to be seeing? And is he bringing his wife? Yeah, well, he said on the record to an American publication that he would be coming back to the UK on various occasions. And as you said, there are some Invictus uh, Games uh, things scheduled for around May. We don't know whether or not he's going to be bringing uh, Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. She is in the UK for an incredibly uh, long time now in hindsight and perhaps she doesn't want to become a bit of a distraction for Prince Harry's Invictus Games which clearly is the main event and something which is very worthwhile but there is all the distractions about how is he going to be kept secure he's of course uh, he, he's appealing here the, the decision by the uh, court which uh, kind of threw out his case against the Home Office over police security so it's all very messy when it comes to mm -hmm. the Duke of Sussex uh, but as for the working royals are very much focused on what's happening here today uh, at Buckingham Palace. And of course, we were told, weren't we, that um, the Princess of Wales would return to some duties after Easter. We're now after Easter. We all wish her well. Obviously, she was forced into a position of having to relay that private medical information, really. Um, but do we know when we might see her, Cameron? Any news? Well, that after Easter message, I'm afraid, is certainly not the up-to-date one because mm. of uh, the princess's cancer diagnosis. She is undergoing preventative chemotherapy at the moment. What I am hearing from those close to the princess is that she may well decide to attend certain events if she feels up to it and if she's really keen to go. Mm. But in terms of a return to full-scale public duties and full, as a full-time working royal, I suspect that's some time to come yet. Mm. But perhaps maybe we'll see her at some point this summer. But it just honestly depends on how her treatment goes. And we just mm -hmm. don't know the answer to that question at the moment. Okay. And Cameron, we saw the King in, in the in the in the privacy mm. of his car at, at Sandringham uh, yesterday, going to church. Um, is he is he going to be doing many public duties? Well, we saw him on Easter Sunday, Andrew, didn't we, in Windsor yeah. Castle. He was greeting the crowds quite unexpectedly. We weren't expecting him to do so. Uh, and that shows there's a real sign that the treatment appears to be going in the right direction. And I think those close to King Charles are really hoping that that's a positive sign as we look towards the summer, the Trooping the Colour Ceremony and the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings, two events the King is keen to attend. They look more likely than they perhaps were uh, back in January. And, of course, the Australia tour, which is being talked about and certainly is not being ruled out mm. by royal sources today. In October. All right, thank you, Cameron. Cameron Walker there uh, down at Buckingham Palace. Now, up next in a change of tone, how seriously should we take speculation that there could potentially be World War Three? You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office. I'm afraid we hold on to unsettled weather across the UK during the week ahead, all of us seeing further spells of rain at times, coupled with quite strong winds at times too. Back to the detail for today, and we've got some bright weather across the south and east of the UK during the morning, but notice showery bursts of rain out towards the west, up across parts of northern England, and further showery bursts of rain will work their way up from the south into many parts of England and Wales as we go through the rest of the day, some of those uh, outbreaks of rain turning quite heavy into the afternoon. Northern Ireland, after a bright start, will see some rain later, where Scotland, seeing the best of the sunshine throughout the day, just a bit of patchy rain across the far south later on. Feeling pleasant enough in that sunshine in the north, up to 12 degrees, but the warmest temperatures generally down to the, towards the southeast, coupled with that uh, wind and rain, though. As for the evening and during the overnight period, we'll see some clearer spells developing across the southeast of the UK for a time, and some clear spells towards the far northwest, but on the whole, low pressure will be dominating the scene, giving a lot of wind and rain, particularly windy down towards the southwest, and wherever you are, with that wind and rain around, it will stay quite mild for the time of year. As for Tuesday, well, another very unsettled day on, on the cards across the UK. Low pressure sitting right across the UK, bringing spells of wind and rain. The wettest weather, generally likely up towards the uh, southern and eastern parts of Scotland, could see up to two inches of rain in places here. And the windiest weather, generally out towards the west and across uh, some southern coasts of England, with gales in places here at times. Temperatures generally cooler than over the last few days, up to 12 or 13 Celsius at best. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? 
incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. So, is Britain ready for war? It's an apocalyptic question. Mm. David Cameron, of course, is off to Washington to warn the US is risking the West security by holding up a new aid package for Ukraine. Uh, meanwhile, former Armed Forces Minister James Heapy has said that this global instability could easily lead to a new Cold War and that we're a long way behind in our preparations. Well, join us is the defence expert of all experts, the defence editor of the Evening Standard, Robert Fox. Robert, we were talking just before you sat down. If, this, if it's as bad as these former defence ministers say, like James Heapy, what did they do about it? Very little. And this is what they're putting their hands up, and he's been supported by his former boss, Ben Wallace. Yeah. Both former army officers. Yeah. There's a slight element, Andrew, of not me, Gov. Hmm. Oh, I tried my best. Oh, and actually, sadly, um, Heapy is very straight on things like that, but he does think as a former junior infantry officer, we're not going to go back to preparing for war as we did before, even in 1939-1940. It's resilience, it's the whole piece that mm. we're under threat constantly from cyber, from space, by mm. that I mean satellite communication. We want light, flexible, contemporary forces. And this, funny enough, the pictures of the parade, it was looking very sentimental, and I, but it's actually how the British are going to work with forces like the French and I mean the French and the northern countries, not so much Germany because they're so riven politically, but it's how we face these very strange threats which we're very focused on Russia, we're very focused on Hamas and quite rightly, but it's not just going to be states, it's going to be a mixture of hybrids and the world is very, very unstable. How did a Tory government, the Tories always were the party that was seen as strongest on defence, the party you could rely on defence. How has it become such a bad... How is the defence... Is it such a mess, frankly? Procurement is disastrous. We've got aircraft carriers which don't appear to work properly, planes that don't fly properly. It's a... Com what went wrong? I think, Andrew, we have to begin at the beginning, and I think that it was a huge mistake to put defence into the austerity basket. Right. It's not that you should have spent uh, profligately, can I say that, mm. but there were great mistakes like the nuclear, which is hugely expensive and costly and it isn't a luxury. And by the way, that is one thing that Rishi Sunak is going to do within two or three weeks. It's going to be a big announcement of uh, the nuclear programme because we're in an era of nuclear proliferation. Mm. And Europe, including France, is looking to Anglo-French leadership on this in view of the political instability in America, if you're following me. Yeah. So nuclear should have been put to one side and they should have looked at what they were going to do after the messy wars that they were coming out of in a very, very inelegant way, namely Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And the other thing, on the whole pol uh, social con uh, context in which you were going to have to recruit, and recruiting's been appalling, they hadn't taken on board the lessons from COVID. What do you mean by that? COVID has changed the shape of uh, British and many, many other societies, particularly in the advanced industrial, post-industrial world. And we're seeing phenomena there, which I'm, I'm doing deep dives onto. Why young people won't go back into work? Huge problem, and particularly into public service. And the public service ethos, if I can 
put it yeah. rather grandly like that, is something that has to be reinvented yeah. for our time. It's not king and country or queen and country or wrapping yourself around the flag. It's this is what our community really needs for us. We can give to the community and the community yeah. And that can social give to us. fabric was, was torn apart, wasn't it? Well, I'm so sorry, Robert, but we've, we've run You've out of time. have got to go back. <laughs> we've run out of time. We've got to go and get you weather. Here's Alex. Yeah. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good day to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. It is going to turn wet and windy for many of us in association with an area of low pressure which has been named Storm Pierrick by Meteo France. Nonetheless, it is going to bring some pretty unsettled weather to many parts of the UK. For the time being, though, some decent sunshine across northern parts of Scotland and eastern England here actually feeling pretty warm in the sunny spells with temperatures here getting into the high teens. Elsewhere, though, turning cooler and a little bit more unsettled because of the wind and the rain that's pushing its way in in association with that feature that I highlighted earlier. So temperatures for many staying in the low to mid teens. As we go later on, then, most places are likely to see some outbreaks of rain. Watch out for some heavy thundery downpours affecting the southeast as we go through this evening. And even elsewhere, the rain could be pretty heavy and persistent, especially across parts of Scotland, where we do have a warning in force. And elsewhere, watch out for those strong, blustery winds with gusts of around 50 to 60 miles per hour, perhaps a bit stronger than that. Because of all the unsettled weather, a mild start to Tuesday morning, but a relatively wet and windy one for many of us. The rain gradually making its way north and east as we go through the day could bring something a little bit wintry over the higher ground. So something a bit dry developing, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland, central southern England and Wales, perhaps even a bit of sunshine breaking out. But notice our temperatures will be down a few degrees compared to today, with highs just about into double figures. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made what my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. <laughs> Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Eleven a.m. on Monday, the eighth of April. This is Britain's News on GP News with Andrew Pearce and Beth Turner. So they are changing the guard. France will become the first non-Commonwealth country to take part in the ceremony at Buckingham Palace this morning. There we can see Sophie and Andrew. That's Edward. Edward, sorry. Keep up. <laughs> Good and, and, a, and a very senior French military type. Very lovely pictures. Lovely pictures. Cameron it's, has more. Yeah, Cameron Walker is there. The British national anthem is just playing. Of course, it's been approved by the king. This historic ceremony celebrating 120 years since the signing of the Autant Cordiale between Britain and France, translated into English as warm understanding. Big manhunt underway. Police looking for 25-year-old Habiba Masoom after a woman was stabbed to death in front of her five-month-old baby in Bradford. And new state pension rates for the tax year coming to effect from today. It's a pay rise for some, but not good news for everyone. Rain is tax turmoil. Questions continue about whether the deputy Labour leader paid the right, um, right amount of tax on the sale of her former council house in 2015. We'll have the latest. Well, we were talking earlier about which <laughs> to be kings clear. and queens we've had since Queen Victoria, <laughs> and Beverly's now informed us that was Prince Andrew at Buckingham Palace. Highly unlikely when he's been banned from public life. He is the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Edward. Oh, thank you very he's much. married to Sophie. And his lovely wife, Sophie, who I'm a big fan of, actually. The but yes, of to be clear, that was Edward, not Andrew. That really would be uh, something yes, would be <laughs> to problem. get excited about. I think the French would be very happy. <laughs> no, right. Get in touch with us this morning, gbnews.com forward slash your say. We've got a new system up and running, lots of live comments coming in. I've been replying to a few of them as well. Uh, first though, the very latest news with Sam Francis. Beth and Andrew, thank you very much and good morning from the newsroom. It's just after 11 o'clock, the top story this hour. Millions of senior citizens will feel the benefits of an 8.5% pension boost from today, worth up to £900 for people that are claiming the full amount. It means last year's rate of £10,600 will rise to £11,500. However, the Liberal Democrats say that the so-called stealth taxes will wipe out over three quarters of that increase as more pensioners are dragged into paying income tax. Well, Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride told GB News this morning that the government is committed to supporting pensioners. We're committed, for example, to the triple lock, which, as you know, is putting up pensions year on year by the greater of 2.5% uh, or earnings or the level of inflation. And I think that's one of the proudest achievements, actually, of this Conservative government that has brought that in, because it's meant that since 2010, uh, pensioners are £1,000 a year better off than they would have been had their pensions just gone up by earnings alone. Labour says that it will digitise children's medical records if it wins the next general election. It's hoping that modernising what's known as the Red Book would boost vaccination rates and improve access to health care. Labour also says it would see parents receive automatic reminders for appointments and health information via the NHS app. Labour leader Sakia Starmer claims his party would give power to the patient, giving people more control over their health care. Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting told GB News earlier that the plan will boost vaccination rates among children. We have a technological transformation fund in the NHS. Let's put it to good use to reduce our reliance on paper, to reduce our reliance on stamps and Royal Mail, and to provide people with a modern service in a way that they access pretty much every other major service in their life at the moment, whether that's online shopping and retail or, or anything else we do by apps. Well, as we've been hearing, a manhunt is continuing today after a woman was stabbed and killed in Bradford while she was pushing a baby in a pram. West Yorkshire police have released photos of a suspect wanted in connection with that attack. 
which happened in the city centre on Saturday afternoon. 25-year-old Habibur Masoom from the Oldham area is described as an Asian man of slim build. He was pictured on CCTV wearing a coat with grey, with white and black stripes. He's believed to have links to the Burnley and Chester areas. Police are now warning people not to approach the suspect and they're urging anyone with any information to contact police on 999. A group of former diplomats say the Foreign Office should be replaced by a new department that they say is less rooted in Britain's colonial past. In a new report titled The World in 2040, the former officials say the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office is anchored in the past. They also say the office's location in Westminster, next to St James's Park in the capital, is elitist and should be replaced with, by, by premises with fewer colonial-era pictures on the wall. That report also calls on Parliament to rebrand the department, creating what they've called a more open working culture as part of its new forward-looking mandate. In other news, the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden has denied claims that the government is failing to prepare for war. Two former defence ministers say that Britain isn't ready for conflict and suggest that some ministers are, they say, just hoping that threats will go away. James Heapy and Ben Wallace cited examples of allies like Sweden, where the public have been given war preparation guidance, including a booklet explaining what to do in a time of war. The intervention from those two long-serving ministers comes as Rishi Sunak faces growing pressure to increase defence spending. The start of this working week has been hit hard by severe travel disruption, with no trains running on some of England's busiest rail routes due to ongoing strikes. Drivers with Aslef Union have walked out in their long-running dispute over pay and conditions, with the South East and East Anglia the worst affected areas, including Southern, Greater Anglia and Thameslink. The dispute has been running now for two years, and there's still no sign of a breakthrough. And finally, before we head back to Andrew and Bev, tens of millions of people will be looking to the skies later for what's set to be the most viewed total eclipse ever. While the weather might eclipse the excitement for some, it's a different story in Canada, though, where clear skies are set to bring near-perfect viewing conditions. Niagara Falls, though, has declared a state of emergency to manage the biggest crowd of visitors ever expected to flock to those popular waterfalls. And here in the UK, some will have a glimpse of a partial eclipse in the west and north, including in Belfast, Glasgow and Liverpool, from just before 8 o'clock tonight. That's the latest from the newsroom for now. You can, of course, sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com alerts. For now, though, it's back to Andrew and Bev. Eleven oh seven. Who is Britain's News? I'm Andrew News. Andrew Pearson, Bev Turner. We're going to go to Buckingham Palace, Bev. <laughs> well, Johnson, the, what's the, the matter with Bev? Why is she laughing so much? Have you got laughing gas? I've just got the giggles today. Some days you just get the yeah. giggles, don't you, on the telly, especially when you're working with him. And, and let me tell you, if Prince Andrew is there, <laughs> the friendships that is a huge story. It'd be at the top of the bulletin. <laughs> he's banned Edward. from public life. It's Prince Edward, his little brother. Uh, let's go live, Cameron. How beautiful is it down there this morning? It's really warm, Bev, and really sunny, and the crowds are so much bigger than a normal changing of the guard ceremony would be on a normal day, and that is because it's the first time French troops are taking part in this historic ceremony. It's been approved personally by His Majesty the King, and the reason being is it's the 120th anniversary of the signing of the Autant Cordiale uh, by Britain and France, which happened in 1904. Translated into English, it means warm understanding, and it ended decades of disputes between Britain and France and paved the way for the two countries really a bond making a friendship between the two nations particularly in the run-up to World War One and World War Two and this ceremony changing of the guard here today is part of a wider strategy by both Britain and France to really strengthen the relationship between the two nations we saw His Majesty the King and Queen Camilla undertake a state visit to France uh, last year it was widely seen as a success 
success both here in Britain and indeed in France. But of course, the king is undergoing cancer treatment uh, at the moment and so is not here in person. The royal standard not flying above Buckingham Palace. In his place is the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, Prince Edward uh, and Sophie. They are currently, I believe, on the dais. You just see uh, Prince Edward there uh, and the French ambassador as well uh, outside on the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. They are going to be inspecting the, both the British and the French troops. 32 members of Jean de Marie's uh, Guard Republicaine and 40 guardsmen from F Company Scots Guard, the guards who have been parading together on the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. Of course, Prince Edward representing his brother, the King there. That's the French ambassador uh, you just see on the dais alongside uh, Edward and Sophie. Hel Helen Duchen uh, is her name, ambassador to the UK. But of course, it is all about strengthening relationships. If you, if we do have pictures of Paris, uh, we can bring you as well, hopefully, at the Elysee Palace, or at least we, d we could a little bit earlier check look on our social media if, if uh, uh, they're not there on, on your screens. Uh, it is there's a similar ceremony happening in France. Emmanuel Macron, the French president, is there alongside 16 soldiers of a number seven company, Coldstream Guards. They have been sent to France to take part in a very similar historic ceremony, the first time foreign troops have uh, guarded the French presidential palace. Again, it's celebrating the 120th anniversary of this agreement between Britain and France. You can just hear behind me the British national anthem playing the French national anthem uh, has just played as well it's marking the end of this changing of the guard ceremony here uh, at Buckingham Palace but I'm assured the French soldiers here on the forecourt of Buckingham Palace are not responsible for guarding the king they are just taking part in this ceremony that responsibility remains very much with British troops lovely thank you Cameron beautiful pictures I think we're lovely. just we're just going to carry on watching the pictures for a bit it, you know it, what? It, the kids it's are... a, and it's a lovely ceremony, actually, of changing the guard. It goes on for about 45 minutes. Yeah. And it, well, it's meticulously timed, actually. And there's always a huge crowd there for it. Mm, especially and... in a week like this, because, of course, the kids are still on exactly. their Easter holidays. There'll and, be lots of tourists there and, today. And, and you see, and you, and you, you see wide-eyed Americans yeah. just amazed and, and, and lapping up every minute of their history because they don't have anything like it mm. back there. Yeah, and I know in some ways it seems a bit anachronistic no, and I know that we're enjoying it, but I can promise you, if my teenagers, they'd be rolling their eyes and going, why does this matter, Mum? Because it is our identity, it this is. is our British character. And in a time when it yep. feels like the globe is becoming one big country, I love the fact that we still Yeah, this. and actually this thing with France is important too, as Robert Fox, the defence editor of The Standard, was yeah. saying, it, we, we really need to have good relations with our um, European allies. Yeah. And, um, so it's Sophie Wessex and Edward and um, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh. And we don't know who that lady is in the navy blue. We presume she might be uh, one of the French be, representatives, yeah, yeah. I imagine. Very stylish. And um, so they'll inspect the, um, the troops right now. Very interesting. Brilliant. Now, we're talking about pensioners because they've had a boost in their pension because, because of the triple lock, 8.5% 8, 8 rise, but... So Almost, quite a few more yeah. are being dragged into tax. That's right. So let's find out why from our economics editor, Liam Halligan. Hello. So it's, it's not just a good news story, this across the board, is it, Liam, for pensioners? Um, quite a lot going on today. Today is the start of the new fiscal year, uh, Monday the 8th of April, and people receiving the basic state pension in this country, it's about 11 million people, <laughs> quite a lot. A lot of uh, voters, Liam. A lot of, a lot. Of, a lot of voters, they tend to mm. vote... They're getting a boost today because the triple lock applies. The triple lock was a Tory slash Lib Dem policy brought in in that coalition between 2020 and 2015. And basically, it's there to protect the rate of the basic state pension, which is quite low by international mm. standards. But the basic state pension each year either goes up by the rate of earnings, the rate of prices, the consumer price index, or 2.5%, whichever's the greater. Now, last April... Sorry, last September, which is the benchmark they use, earnings went up by 8.5%. That was the biggest of those three numbers. So that's what's going on today. So let's have a quick look at those numbers here. We see the basic state pension, so the triple lock does apply. Both Tories and Labour have said it will continue to apply after the next election if either of them wins power. That means a rise of 8.5% 
in the basic state pension from April today. Now, we have to delineate here because the basic state pension split. If you've qualified since April 2016, that means your weekly basic state pension is now £221.20. That's up from £203.85 a week. That's if you've qualified since April uh, 2016. If you qualify before April 2016, so you're slightly older, your £169.50 a week goes has just gone up from £156.20 a week. So there are the 8.5% increases. So a lot of pensioners will say it's crazy, you know, people in France and Germany get more. Other people will think quietly, I don't actually need the basic state pension, I'm going to put this towards my skiing fund or my wine mm. fund or just mm. give it to my grandparents. Mm. This is the problem with what we call universal benefits. They're right across the board. The basic state pension is not means-tested, it's just reliant on you having paid your national insurance yeah. when you've been either in or out of the workforce. Mm. The um, triple lock, uh, the, the, it, would it become a big issue at the general election? Labour saying at the moment, but they're not saying they'll commit to it for the duration of a parliament? I think they have. They've got right. very close to saying they'll commit okay. to it for the duration of the parliament. Of course, Rachel Reeves is petrified She's of saying chance. anything that, is. that determines any money whatsoever, but mm -hmm. I'd put a lot of money on Labour... That it would be a massive U-turn now if right. they didn't commit to the triple lock, not least because the Tories have. Easier to commit to a triple lock while inflation is falling, which That's is. right, that's right, that's right. But to come on to Bev's point, and it is a really important point, uh, we've seen two cuts in national insurance from 12 to 10 and then 10 to 8% in January and indeed mm. this month respectively. They are employee E worker national insurance contributions. That's going to give us each, the average worker, about 900 quid extra in tax a year. But in that sentence, I just said the average worker, because of course only workers sure. pay mm. national no insurance. Pensions. Pensioners don't pay national insurance, so pensioners aren't getting a cut in their headline rate of tax. Pensioners do pay income tax on their yeah. pensions, believe it or not. And as you rightly say, Bev, because the personal allowance is frozen at 12 and a half grand, and because that's roughly where the basic mm. state pension is more and more basic state pensioners are now having to pay income tax. It seems crazy. All this admin to give these pensioners money and then you take some take of it, it back from in back. tax. Well, talking of taxes, Liam, thank you. Brilliant, as always. Labour's Angela Rayner is in hot water over her capital gains tax deal. It's not going away, this story, is it? Should she just come clean and tell us who advised her to do that and what the advice was? We're going to debate that next. Britain's Newsroom on GB News. and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it would destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer <laughs> day and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always is looking ahead uh, actually politics aside what is genuinely the best thing for this country
I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Eleven nineteen. It was Britain's newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. I am still looking at your comments coming in. It's brilliant. I'm replying to some of you on gbnews.com forward slash your say. What are they saying? Come on. For some reason, my name on here is Roger Turner, which is my dad. <laughs> now, obviously, with all new technology, I think what it is, I think I registered my dad so he could watch stuff online, but I did it with my email address. Right. So New you technology, you're so calling you got... a chat room. So new it, technology. It, 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 people are wondering who's replying. It's, yeah. it's not your dad, it's you. It's so not... you haven't got something to tell us that you've turned into Roger. So, no, I am not Roger Turner. She's I'm... transitioned. She's transitioned. <laughs> Anything goes. I'm right. going to support so, you on your journey. Yeah, well, um, anyway, lots of you getting in touch, uh, talking about the pension rise, um, this, this mothy Tim, it says, a pension rise is great, paying tax is fair, the crime is the freeze on the tax allowance yes, rates. Um, and also, the French Guard says, Jill, in our palace, if the French Guard, our palace, as well as they have stopped the boats coming over to GB, would now be a good time to take a photo of the palace. Well, that would help improve Entente Cordiale a lot, wouldn't it? The French police, <laughs> who were paying hundreds of millions of pounds, did their job and stopped the boats. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we should be getting better value for, for, for our money, certainly. And Definitely. somebody called Spike Milligan says, oh. I retired oh. in 2010 and I've been paying income tax from day one. Mm. Right. Uh, Matthew and Emma are here with us we again. Uh, right, we, what do we want to talk about first? Do we want to talk about Angela Rayner? So she's still on the front base. She's not oh, well, going then. away, Only Emma. She's northern. It's not. Look, it's there's, a, she's there's a few things. That's what I David think. Lammy thinks. Uh, do you know what? I think she's not quite said. what David Lammy thinks. Oops, yes, sorry, it is. she should have paid up. It's course, probably fifteen hundred pounds. It's now snowballed into this. Yeah, Daily Mail are absolutely obsessed. Do you know what though? Slightly different angle. I don't think this plays that badly for her. I think at least we're not talking about non-don billionaires like yeah. the Sunaks. We are talking about a woman who clearly had a bit of a chaotic personal life. I, I think what she did, I think she probably has done something wrong, but at least people are seeing a woman in a council or a couple of council homes, normal photos, normal woman, hubby over there, kids over there. Was who caring for her it, disabled child as well. Yeah. Very a lot of people won't have known that. was in hospital worst, for eight months. It's not the yeah. worst look in the world. I think the Daily Mail have become obsessed with it and that they're trying to pull... It, well, it's because some... it, ca it came out in the Michael Ascoff book about Angelina, the Red Queen, yeah. that, 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 that this this discrepancy, yes. potential discrepancy, yes. and I think I'm with you. If she just said hands up, yeah. I might have made a mistake about this. I'm going to sort it out. Yeah. And because during the great expenses scandal, Matthew, you'll remember there were a number of MPs oh, who flipped their properties to avoid capital gains tax, and I can remember the, the, the MP for. Uh, she was a Labour minister, used to ride a motorbike. Hazel Blears. Uh, Hazel yeah. Blears, Tiny. waving a cheque for about £13,000, saying, yes. I'm off to HMRC to so, pay my yeah. bill. So what I think's happened is, and, absolutely, and I, th I think that this... So the, 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 uh, one of the issues of dispute is Angela says she's had uh, tax and uh, advice, uh, and that's told her that she doesn't owe anything, because I think that she was told... She, well, which I think her instinct would have been to do it, plus I think the, the Labour hierarchy would have told her to go to get this tax advice, and if you do owe anything... Because we're talking about the maximum we think she owed was three and a half grand. Yeah. Um, um, uh, you know, which obviously now she could pay because she's on an MP's salary. Um, uh, she, um, she should have paid it at the time. She should have paid it at the time. What I mean is she should be able to pay. Yeah. It wouldn't I mean, be an it's, issue. It's, it's she, could write, she could do a Hazel Blears and write the cheque, yeah. is what I mean. Yeah. But I think what happened is, is that she must, th th they must be confident from that advice that there isn't anything owing. Otherwise, to close the story down I'm not for three sure. and a half grand, I'm not you'd sure have closed it down. I'm not sure she's shown yeah. the advice to the Labour leadership. I think she's just told them she's had this advice. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a bit unclear I mean, whether she's shown it to uh, the legendary Sue Gray, um, Keir's chief of staff, and uh, who had a uh, 
decade of running the ethics at the Cabinet Office, uh, and then obviously that ended in Partygate. Um, uh, but it, I mean, if Sue's seen it, she would have gone through it line by line. I, yes, my would. instinct is is that they think that they, they they would have thought we could close this down. She'd write a check. Does she need to write a check? Ask the question. Got the advice, and the answer is no. Actually, Catherine, one of our viewers, has raised a very interesting point, and she says if Rayner was renting out the property to her brother, which, which is, is the allegation, said, yeah, we don't know that he paid rent. Well, this is the thing. She said she would have received rental income, which should have been declared to the HMRC That's on right. that tax yeah. return. So yeah. did she get income in cash or in cash? Well, there's a thing called rent a room, which it, where you don't have to pay um, if you only charge a few hundred quid a month, well, and it's I your main home. She might also say if it was her brother, she wasn't charging him rent. Exactly. So we don't know that but she's actually, even paying. But she's maintaining she was living in the house at the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even she was in that house. Yeah, even, even though, though the neighbours say she was she's a... a Landlady. Liar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and again, the, we don't know that some of the neighbours haven't got a downer on her. They might, you know, they might disagree with her politically. Well, they, they, might might disagree about, they, they might be telling the truth, man. It is she they, they could be, which is why she might the, not be telling Which is why, at the moment, let's remind the police are having a, another look at it and they Stockport are. Council are looking in on the council's tax and electoral registration. Time. I mean, let's get real. What a waste of police time. It is hugely amusing, though, to see the Daily Mail going through these photographs, comparing cushions, comparing the, back, the background of gardens. And did you say you've got well, home? Does well, that mean home or does it mean your partner's house? And what are the children doing? And is that that children's bedroom or that and I think I think that's almost so over the top it's almost risks pushing her into sympathy because like yes. w w what do you mean by home can you and you know obviously you can have you know more than one home you know they did have a you know a can sort of you? So, well you you can both in law and obviously you can yeah. in reality so it's all it, it, I think that there in there is you know Angela why did David Lammy go on about her being a northern woman? I don't know um I mean I think I mean Angela... he says, but he, he says prejudice and yeah. but, but which is what she say. thinks Angela thinks that she's that did, she, she's did, held to a higher he also said that she does she does not not have to be judged to the same standard or level of people who are in government. That is completely wrong. I disagree with that, absolutely. I think that we, everybody, a and I think he would disagree with that. Yeah, that's well. a shameful and thing I, for the man who's going to be foreign secretary. I think Labour are going to have to get used to much yes. greater scrutiny on absolutely. their affairs because yeah. they are going to be in power. Yeah. And let's remember, Angela Rayner has, has mm. been a, an attack dog. For oh, yeah. not only Rishi Sunak and his wife specifically, but for other people, she's been Boris very, Johnson very aggressive on other people's financial affairs Nadine and their other... Sahawi, exactly. The Tory chairman So, you know, taxes. you dish out, yeah. if you dish if you're out, you've got to be able to take it. Yeah, to, yeah. Uh, stones, I mean, you have to... I'd say to all politicians, be very careful about constantly calling but, yeah. for people to go. She girls. always brings social class into she insults. Does. She does. She always talks about the Etonian, the, the old scum. boys club, the yeah, Tory scum. Yeah, the Tory scum as well. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I mean, she... she. I mean, I mean, she has... I mean, she obviously is deputy leader like John Prescott was, but there is something of the John Prescott who, you know, who was always conscious of... Of his background, and actually, I think people would take Angela seriously, and I'm very glad she's there as a voice. So she doesn't need to be but John worried that she shouldn't have that place at the table. She most certainly should. It was because yeah. of John Prescott's background; he was there because Blair needed an authentic working class Absolutely. voice to help him get his reforms of the Labour Party through the party. Whereas, of course, Keir has a more working class background, or a massively more working class background than uh, people don't than think Tony. he does because he stupidly took a knighthood. Yes. People so it's think interesting posh. you say that. Yeah, people it, think he's posh because he's got a, he's a knight. That's true. But some Labour polling say, apparently says that people like it because it shows he's respectable and you know he likes the Queen, you know, and the King and the monarchy because he took it. Right. It's the Queen at the time. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think I thought that, but on the other hand, people like him because it makes him sort of you know. Yep. I don't think people think British. of him as working class. I don't. Honestly, I, don't. I think he's dabbled a tool maker well, as he constantly reminds us. Yeah, but he's capital yes. E establishment, middle yeah. class lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when he was first Labour leader, when he used to do being wheeled around the studios, his aide would say, "Just call him Keir." Don't call him Sir Keir, just call him Keir. So if he'd ever come on anything, I'd say, I'm now joined by Sir Keir Starmer. <laughs> and you call him Sir Keir in every bit of copy you write, Andrew, don't you? Every single time. Exactly. Know, you take your title, use it. I think, uh, to be fair, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you take your title, yeah, you have to do your time. Yeah. Do your right, should we talk about the fact that we're all getting fat from not going to the office, Emma Wolfe? Well, no, people are just not. generally not... <laughs> well, Emma's I, so slim. But I zoom around on a Yeah, bike. you cycle. Um, look, I think this whole flexible I working don't. thing, it is up to the employer. The employer sets the rules. What happened? Why are employees suddenly deciding they want this, they want that? Of course we need to be open to different models. But I actually think employers get to decide what are the parameters of their job. If they need you in the office, if they need you on site, I'm afraid I'm with... Yeah. I'm not as hardcore as Jacob Rees-Mogg on this, but I think that we need to just get kind of... We shift the balance into 
you, you don't get to demand it. So the, it's the new law is that it needs you there. from today, the new, so you've always been able to ask after you've been employed for 26 weeks, you can have flexible working. And remember, it's an ask, you don't, you know, they can mm. say no, they have to give justification, but they can but say no. But you always ask? Yes, but only after 26 weeks of being employed. Right. So now you can ask okay. from day one, okay. which I actually, I'm going to defend this because I think that, you know, if you ask the question on day one, A, you get the answer and then you can plan your life accordingly. Whereas it's a bit weird if you want flexible working, you know, because of particular responsibilities mm. and you get 26 weeks in, you've done it. So, I mean, as long as employers have the right to sensibly say no, if that's not inappropriate for you to flexibly work, then it seems okay to but, me. And there is a more serious point that Bev was raising about the couch potato element, that people yeah. are spending days at home. They are basically sedentary in front of screens, in front of yeah. computers, yeah. mostly in front of phones. And I think this is all mm. contributing to our major, major crisis in this country, which is obesity. Yeah, you get your steps in if you go to the office. It isn't anything else. The crisis, the, you know, yeah. really putting pressure on the NHS, is obesity, it depression, is. Yeah. mental illness, all the stuff that Obesity comes around not doing much. Obesity costing the NHS more than treating cancer, yes. smoking. Yes. Which is extraordinary. But also, obesity uh, exacerbates things like it causes yeah. cancer and all that. Yeah, of things. course it does. Yeah. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because in some ways, it's what working parents, particularly mothers, were trying to campaign for for decades was to get a little bit more understanding yes. with bosses. And now that it's, ha I have to say, maybe I'm just getting old, but now I'm, I don't want working mothers to seem like a liability if you're interviewing a working mum. I don't want the employer sitting there thinking, actually, I'm not sure I'm going to employ her because she might want to work flexibly. But remember, they can still say no. I think that it's crucial that the employer can determine what works for the employer. I actually think asking the question on day one rather than at the end of week 26 is, is it doesn't seem to me to make a huge amount of difference because presumably the answer will be the same because it depends on the nature of the job, doesn't it? And I suppose it's just about, well, give me a go and if I'm not being productive in the way that you want to, then it isn't working. You have to make sure that there are then safeguards in place that if it doesn't work also the employer, And I also think flexible working is things like can I start early and leave at three rather than feeling bad? Because, yeah. you know, sure. we're mums. When you have yeah. to leave at three and go to the blooming nursery, yeah. sometimes you do. It doesn't mean you weren't working from seven in sure. the morning or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Flexible just means... It doesn't, oh, it doesn't necessarily mean work working around. at home. It means, you know, uh, uh, yeah. arrangements uh, uh, that can be made to, to fit around your life. And actually, it's not just working mums, actually. It's about a lot of people are now caring for the elderly as yeah, well. Absolutely. We're discussing we've, the elderly. we've got such terrible social population. care that it might be on a Friday, I want to visit my mum in yeah. the care home, can I do a, a flip my day yeah. over so I work later on to what you yeah, know exactly and I think that's probably a good thing um, right thank you Emma thank you Matthew thank you. Um, we've got lots more to come well, it's only half 11 we've got another half an hour with you but first here's Sam with your headlines Good afternoon. Good morning, in fact, from the GB newsroom. It's just after half past 11. The top stories this hour. Millions of senior citizens will feel the benefits of an 8.5% pension boost from today, worth up to £900 for people claiming the full amount. It means last year's rate of £10,600 will rise to £11,500. The Liberal Democrats, though, say more pensioners will now be dragged into paying income tax. But the Work and Pensions Secretary, Mel Stride, says that the government is committed to supporting pensioners. Labour says it will digitise children's medical records if it wins the next election. It's hoped that modernising what's known as the Red Book would boost vaccination rates and improve access to health care. Labour also say it would see parents receive automatic reminders for appointments and health information via the NHS app. In other health news, NHS staff, including paramedics and nurses, have been shown pornographic images, offered money for sex and assaulted at work. That's according to new research. A study of more than 12,000 health workers has revealed that widespread incidents of sexual harassment are in place, with one in ten saying it's something they've experienced at work. Of those, almost a third reported sexual assault. In response to the findings by Unison, the government has said NHS organisations have a responsibility to protect their staff and patients. And a group of former diplomats say the Foreign Office should be replaced by a new department that's less rooted in Britain's colonial past. In a new report titled The World in 2040, the former officials say the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office is anchored in the past. And they also say the office's location in Westminster is elitist and should be replaced by premises with fewer colonial era pictures on the wall. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts.
for exclusive, limited edition and rare gold coins that are always newsworthy. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a look at the markets this morning. The pound will buy you $1.2628 and €1.1661. The price of gold is currently £1,851.18 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,919 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Emily and Tom are here with us. We're just talking about the new system on gbnews.com forward slash your say, where we can see what you're saying in real time. Are but the best, guys... the best thing is everyone can talk to each other, reply yeah. in the threads. It's, it's like it's a whole conversation yeah. that everyone's involved yeah. in. Very Except nice. that I'm registered as Roger Turner, which is my dad. So I've been <laughs> replying to all of you. Yeah, I think I registered my dad before I registered myself so he could go on the website. Well, now you can stitch him up, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think she might be transitioning. <laughs> <laughs> this is my alter ego. Well, we want everyone's say on this uh, shock new polling about attitudes among British Muslims. Now, this oh, has been yes. yeah, this mm. has been commissioned and it's been done by Jella, JL Partners, and it shows a few things that are a little bit shocking. So, apparently, according to this data, 52% of British Muslims believe that it should be illegal to show a picture of the Prophet Muhammad. 52%. <laughs> Only 28% say it would be undesirable to outlaw homosexuality in this country, and 32%, 32% favour Sharia law. Mm. And that is uh, fairly shocking polling, but mm. it does feed into previous polling that we've seen in previous years, and there's a question that arises from it that we'll be asking and we'll be debating on the show, yeah. and that's a question of integration. Yeah. Because, of course, even with these numbers, there are lots of Muslims in the UK who would be shocked by these yeah. statistics. I there are lots so. of Muslims who are well integrated and um, would consider themselves mm. to be uh, signed up to British values. Yeah. But clearly there's a problem mm. with a significant proportion of British Muslims who live in a parallel yeah. life, who live in perhaps mm. ghettoised communities, who don't subscribe yeah. to the values of free speech uh, and tolerance that are fundamental to the British character. And maybe you'd, feminism. Yeah, and you'd like well. to fly on the wall sometimes in the mosques when um, the preachers are talking to them. What's, what are they saying to these... Uh, and, yeah. and what, age, what age are these people? We don't know what age. Well, what's quite particular. interesting, and we'll get into this uh, during the show, but it's actually some of these strongest opinions, particularly when it comes to whether you support what Hamas did or whether you believe yeah. they did uh, disgusting things. Uh, it's actually the educated young, That's those what who've gone to university. That's what's so, mm. is the failure of integration? People assume that once you've been in this yeah. country for a long time, yeah. generations, etc. But actually, some of the views are getting harsher, which Just... is even more worrying. Right, that and much more this afternoon with Emily and Tom. For now, though, you're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. We'll be right back after this quick break. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit about Sebastian? Um, I just, it really amazes me how a mother um, who can lose a child in such a shocking and unexpected way, so little, so precious, can then turn that grief into something so positive. How did you find the strength to get up, um, get a camera crew, as you say, travel to the other side of the world and investigate all of this? Um, I was angry at Sebastian for dying. Um, you know, you feel like saying, God, I, yeah, 32 years later and I can still get very, very upset about it. I was angry that something, that, that while, he, while he was born and lived with me and slept and then died, they were actively campaigning in New Zealand to try and stop this happening because they had a very high cot death rate there. Um, they had the, the, the lady, uh, the Anne Diamond, if you like, of uh, New Zealand, a, a television presenter called Judy Bailey, went on telly every night and said, if you're just about to put your baby down to sleep, put him on his or her back, not the tummy, and this will help. And there, cot death rate plummeted. And I went out to New Zealand and met her, and it was anger that drove me to come back and demand that we have the same advert here, um, the same campaign. And, of course, I got all this complete nonsense from the Department of Health saying, you know, oh, young mothers do not watch television, I was told. In other words, while New Zealand 
mums were being told how to save their babies' lives. We actively denied British mums that advice wow. during the time that Sebastian and others were dying. And, and the other point I suppose to make is it's helpful to educate all generations because when I think when I had my mm. babies, my mum would say, oh, he's not settling, just stick him on his tummy, he'll be much happier, that's what we did with you. And we had to say, well, things have changed and, you know, yes. th but it's about educating everybody because it's not everybody. just the mums Everybody's... that get their hands on the babies. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Welcome back, 11.39, you're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. So Police Scotland have confirmed they've now received hate crime, hate crime complaints from members of the public during yesterday's football match between Rangers and Celtic. So those TV viewers were apparently offended <laughs> by some of the football chants. They've never been to a football match before. This combined with uh, the number of complaints since this legislation came into force last week has now reached 10 Thousand. I think it's making Scotland a laughing stock. Well, it's certainly going to be making the police very busy. Well, joining us now from Benchmark Advocates Scotland is Thomas Leonard Ross. Good morning, Thomas. Thank Hello. you so much, uh, KC. Good Thank morning. you for joining us. Um, this, well, first of all, what do you make of this legislation anyway? This idea that you could be uh, reported to the police for stirring up hate just by yeah. words that you might use about against particular characteristics. I've, I've never heard as much rubbish talked about any legislation in 40 years in the business. I mean, there's been some gross exaggerations of its effect, and almost all of it was already law in Scotland, and actually the new bit simply extended the offence of stirring up racial hatred to a number of other protected categories. And what's bad about it, really, is it's so complicated that it's impossible to understand it. And my prediction is that nobody will ever be prosecuted under it. Isn't this the new section, though, Thomas, uh, the encouragement, perhaps it's the marketing campaign that's come with it from the Scottish government, the idea that you should be encouraged to snitch on people that you hear talking in this way and having these yeah. drop-in centres where you can report a, 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 a alleged crime with a language? Yeah, that's nothing to do with the Act. I mean, the, this is a response to the Stephen Lawrence inquiry where it was, uh, it was suggested that police forces in the UK should record hate crime. So this has been going on in Scotland for years. It's nothing to do with the new legislation. Okay. Why do you think people have reacted in this way then, Thomas? Because 10,000 complaints already is extraordinary. It, it, and I can't believe all of these yeah. people are just doing it to embarrass the SNP government. Well, I mean, they're incredibly unpopular. The, the SNP government are incredibly unpopular at the moment and widely believed to be focusing on the wrong issues. And, uh, you know, there, there's quite a hard core of people who support independence who seem to be prepared to excuse them more or less anything. And then there's the majority who are looking forward to the time when they're no longer in a position to pass this sort of legislation. So, uh, undoubtedly, amongst that group, it's been weaponised, the legislation's been weaponised and, and people who oppose the SNP, which seems to be the majority, see this as an opportunity to show how hopeless they are, essentially, and, uh, uh, you know, are, 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 are dining out on it. So there, there's a lot of that. And in addition, that uh, you know, there, there's the JK Rowling issue, uh, which has led to a lot of people piling on one side or the other. Uh, so no, what about the football match yesterday, on. Thomas? The football match, Celtic and Rangers, it's a, yeah. a t traditional grudge match. There's often sectarian yes. abuse. Now there's been yeah. hundreds of complaints about that. 
Yeah, well, I mean, that was uh, predictable. I, I don't think that actually reading between the lines, I don't think there has been anywhere near as many as people were predicting, to be honest. And uh, maybe because of the, the way the match went, you know, Celtic scored very, very early, which dampened the spirits of the crowd a wee bit. And, uh, you know, for 45 minutes, the Rangers team didn't turn up. So, I mean, it might be different when there's a, a proper match when both sides are... And there were no Celtic fans there yesterday also. It was all uh, Rangers fans. So maybe the test will be next season when the fans are all in the stadium together. It took three years to debate this legislation, didn't it, Thomas? It started in 2021. Obviously, there might have been some disruption maybe in that year because of pandemic um, restrictions, yeah. etc. Um, but it, it clearly is a serious piece of legislation in terms of the SNP mm -hmm. because they, they debated for a very long time about the phraseology of it. Uh, it's actually stranger than you say. Uh, the debate was finished by 2021. <laughs> the, the legislation was really complete in 2021, and it then took them three years to bring it in. And, and I think the delay was the police were saying, well, we don't really understand this. There's going to have to be training and education within the police force. And they were encouraged to push back the, the date in which the act came into force. But I'm not sure about any further forward. I mean, the, the police have now been inundated with complaints. Mm. Uh, the police are complaining that uh, they weren't properly trained, they weren't properly ready for it. So the whole, uh, there's no doubt the whole thing actually appears like a complete mess. But for the lawyers, and I'm sure it only will be the lawyers who actually sit down and read the legislation, it's not as big a change to the existing law as people are making out. OK, all right. Well, that's reassuring in a way. Uh, Thomas Leonard Ross KC there from Benchmark Advocates Scotland. The, 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 sheer, the sheer volume of complaints, though, it's going to overwhelm the police. Yeah. And if you're a thug and a crook in Scotland, terrific. Yeah. Because the police are going to be completely distracted because this is the SNP government's that's flagship such legislation. It's a mess, isn't it? And it, such is, a, it mess. is a mess. And they should, should have thought twice. I mean, from what Thomas was saying, they didn't need it anyway. Yeah. Well, listen, still to come this morning, there's this manhunt underway. They're looking for police are looking for 25 year old Habiba Masoom. He uh, alleged to have stabbed a woman to death in front of her baby in Bradford. We're going to be hearing from the local shopkeeper who was at that scene. He was Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? 
incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. So an urgent manhunt continues for the man suspected of stabbing a woman to death in broad daylight in Bradford city centre. West Yorkshire police detectives are searching for 25-year-old Habibur Massoum. Our reporter Anna Riley is in Bradford uh, at the scene and brings us the latest. Anna. Yes, this incident is something that has truly shocked the community. It happened at around 20 past three on Saturday afternoon, as you say, in broad daylight. A 27-year-old mother who was pushing her baby in, the pra in a pram uh, was stabbed and, and tragically died as a result. Now, we've been speaking to people in the area, including a shopkeeper, Gio Khan. He heard the screams of the woman and he came out to her aid along with a doctor and this is what he had to tell us. She was lying down and uh, the head was down and you know all I see at the back and the baby was, the pram was there and then I tried to check her nerves, pulse and uh, you know she wasn't there the pulse then within a few minutes an uh, Asian doctor Come and he goes, look, I am a doctor and let me check her. And he had his bag with him and he started checking her. And the main, what we did, we turned her over and the blood was all over, on the floor, on her body. And then uh, there was a stabbing marks, well, not marks, but wound on the neck, really deep neat wounds. They were all over her neck. And what was that like, seeing that? It was disgusting, actually. Uh, I couldn't uh, take it in, but I'm tried my best to, you know what I mean, calm myself down. But doctor was brilliant. And uh, I.K. Taylor was already, you know, them next door, they were already calling the ambulance and the doctors. So Gio Khan there uh, describing those shocking scenes that he witnessed. He said uh, that he knew the victim, that she used to visit his shop and that she was a kind lady uh, that often smiled. So the community deep in shock about what's happened. And that manhunt is nationwide. So every police force in the country now is looking for 25-year-old Mazoom. He's described as a slim Asian man. CCTV footage nearby has uh, showed pictures of him. I don't know if we can show that on screen of him wearing a duffel coat with three large horizontal lines of grey, white and black and also wearing a light blue or grey tracksuit with one witness saying that they'd seen him in a grey hoodie as well. So police are warning people if you do see him to stay away from him, do not approach him, but contact them on 999 with any sightings. And as we have more information on this case, we will bring it to you. Anna, um, harrowing interview with the shopkeeper. I think he, he knew the, 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 the girl who was murdered because she was a regular in his shop. Yes, that's correct. That's what he told us. Uh, and as I mentioned, he said that she was a, a lovely woman. He said that she always had a smile and was kind and completely shocked as well that this happened, as we've said, in broad daylight um, and that the, the baby was there as well. So, yes, deeply shocked about what has happened and just hoping as well, he said, that the, the person that's responsible for this is brought to justice. All right, thank you, Anna. Well done. Anna Riley there up uh, in Bradford doing a great job. Now, I think we're going to take a little uh, take a look at what Keir Starmer's been saying. Yes. Pressure's he's, mounting, isn't it? He's had to talk about Angela Rayner because he's out and about and he's been pressed about her tax affairs. Yeah, let's have a listen to what he had to say. 
Lorraine has been asked no end of questions about this. She's answered them all. She said she's very happy to answer any further questions from the police or from any of the um, authorities. Uh, I don't need to see the legal advice. My team has seen it. But I will say this, that on the day that the A&E figures, people waiting more than 24 hours in A&E, we now know that they are ten times as high as they were five years ago. The idea that the Tories want to be focusing on what Andrea Rayner uh, how much time she spent with her ex-husband ten years ago. I can tell you here, at this hospital, nobody but nobody is interested in that. They're very, very interested in what are you going to do about the A&E problem caused by this government. Fascinating that he hasn't seen the advice she claims she's had, which says she's in the clear. Why wouldn't he demand it? He's got a woman there called Sue Graves, the chief of staff. She used to be head of civil service ethics and propriety. Why hasn't she demanded to see it? She's his mate, though, isn't she? She is. He might be right in that it's not necessarily what people are talking about, but show us your leadership, Keir Starmer, yeah. talking about in the hospital. Show us your leadership. Show us what you expect from your MPs and from your staff, yeah. what you will expect from your cabinet. If you, pay ta if you owe taxes, you've got to pay them. Whether, whether it's £3,000 or £3 million, it's mm. the principle. But I think she's made a horlicks of this from the beginning. She's she has. She's just put her hands up and said, I might have screwed up here. People would have said, OK. Yeah. Yeah, she but could have But, of course, you've done. got David Lammy telling us, oh, well, it's all because she's a northern woman. <laughs> well, you northern Not women. You we northern know. women. You've got a lot to answer for, you know. <laughs> you northern women. I don't think he's saying she, she cooked the books because she's a northern woman. I think he says he, the Tories are picking on the her. Tories are picking on her because she's from up north. Right, listen, before we go for the day today, just to remind you, gbnews.com forward slash your say to get involved with Good Afternoon Britain. I've been fascinated by looking at all your comments coming in this morning. I've been happy to respond uh, to some of you. We will be back tomorrow morning at 9.30 to do it all over again. But first, though, here are Emily and Tom with Good Afternoon Britain. My goodness, what a sensational pivot there from Keir Starmer. Asked about Angela Rayner, he doesn't want to talk about it. Well, we'll be looking more into that, but also the attitudes of British Muslims. 52% want to make showing the picture of the Prophet Muhammad illegal. We'll have that debate. And it's a payday for pensioners out there. 8.5% inflation busting raise. But if you're a pensioner sitting at home, do you, do you feel better off? That's the question. Do you feel better off? That and, of course, a solar eclipse affecting some parts of the UK. We'll be chasing that eclipse too after this. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good day to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. It is going to turn wet and windy for many of us in association with an area of low pressure which has been named Storm Pierrick by Meteo France. Nonetheless, it is going to bring some pretty unsettled weather to many parts of the UK. For the time being, though, some decent sunshine.